So thank you for joining. Uh, we're gonna get started. People will still probably join over the next minute or two, but I thought I could, uh, uh, first of all, thank everybody for joining and thank the speakers um, and give a little bit of background about what we do at the Super Center, but also to say that uh, we're hosting this as a webinar. So if you, do, if you have questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions and I'll moderate those questions. There'll be a some time after each talk to ask a couple of questions and then there'll be a longer uh, session for Q&A at the end of all the presentations. So welcome to the day of learning. Um, in the past, we would have these sorts of meetings uh, in person, uh, sometimes in the evenings with cocktails. Obviously that became harder in the past couple of year or so. Um, we actually got, we like the webinar format because we have people joining from all over the world at this point. Although of course the face-to-face -face meetings have a huge benefit as well. So I do want to start by um, thanking, thanking you from the Cyber Autism Center. The Cyber Autism Center uh, was founded more than uh, 25 years ago to study uh, the causes and treatment of autism. And um, over time, uh, through the work of geneticists uh, and others, we've begun to appreciate that autism shares a lot of risk with many developmental disorders and many of the causes of autism are also causes for other disorders. And so the Seaver Center has now taken a much broader view to look at developmental disorders uh, quite broadly and look at the behavioral manifestations of those disorders and think about uh, certain genetic syndromes from the point of view of uh, novel treatments. So it's a big group at the Seaver Center and I wanted to highlight um, some of the people that uh, are relevant today, most relevant. So uh, as I'll show you on the next slide, we have a very specific approach to rare disorders. Um, and um, the leadership for DDX3X at the Seaver Center represents different areas of expertise. Dorothy Grice, who will present today, a uh, child psychiatrist, Sylvia de Roubaix, who will also present today, who's a molecular and cellular and animal uh, behavior neuroscientist. Nan Yang, uh, who um, will not present today, but one of uh, a postdoc that she and I jointly mentor will present, and Nan is an expert on stem cells. And Anna Kostic, who also won't present today, <clears throat> is an expert, she comes from uh, biotech and pharma, and she's an expert on drug discovery and development for rare disorders. So. That team uh, and with, my, with, with me as well, work with a lot of the experts at the Seaver Center, clinicians, MDs, psychologists, and so on, um, a lot of basic scientists as well, to uh, really kind of push forward, uh, you know, understanding the causes, the, the, the behavioral manifestations of DDX3X, understanding what's going wrong in terms of changes in the brain. And ultimately the thought is to think about new and improved treatments for DDX3X syndrome. So this is the leadership team. And then um, I've kind of foreshadowed this a little bit, but the way we look at DDX3X syndrome and rare syndromes in general is um, we wanna have expertise in understanding the molecular target, in this case, the gene. We want to also apply expert approaches to studying human nerve cells and culture. We want to also develop animal models of, this, of the disorder. And of course, we want to spend a, as much time as possible with the families and with the individuals with the syndrome to understand the phenotypes or the behaviors, to understand um, what are some clinical endpoints that might be important to target, to develop uh, biomarkers that can tell you when things are getting better or worse, and then ultimately to become what we call a clinical trial ready to be able to actually do a clinical trial in the syndrome and go so far as to create a multi-site network. We've done this before for rare disorders. It turns out of course, that it's much better to have multiple expert sites working together than a single site for a rare disorder. So um, this is how we kind of approach the expertise. And you know what we develop as, over the course of this is of course is very, very specific assays, ways to test the activity of DDX3X. We develop uh, 
stem cells, which are used for, to make human neurons, which you'll hear about later. We develop mouse models in this case, or sometimes rat models, which you'll also hear about. And we do a lot of work prospectively, in other words, in person, uh, looking at um, the neurobehavioral phenotypes. And um, you'll hear about that as well. And when you think about that in the context of DDD, which is short for drug discovery and development, the way I use it, what we need to do is um, understand that target, DDX3X, the protein, and then think about lead compounds that might be gene targeted or might be um, small molecules. And if we have some compounds or things to test, we can test them in our cellular assays, which we'll talk about briefly, which Becky will talk about. If something works in the cellular assay, so these are uh, cells growing in a Petri dish, then they can be tested ultimately in the mouse model that you hear about from Sylvia. And of course, if they work in the mouse model, then uh, with a lot of work between here and here, basically making sure the drug is safe and gets to where it needs to go, then we can think about clinical trials. So this pipeline is how we think about uh, rare disorders. And um, as I mentioned, the, the, the leadership team uh, looks at this with various expert perspectives. So starting with the perspective assessment uh, and the phenotyping, clinical endpoints and clinical, and clinical trials, Dorothy Grice will present some of the work together with Tess Levy about that work to date. Uh, Sylvie de Roubaix leads the animal model program and she'll present some of the work on what she sees in these mouse models and behavioral endpoints and the possibility of translatable biomarkers. Um, Nan and I, as I said, jointly supervise Rebecca Pollock who will present about um, what we're doing with stem cells, which is still at an early stage. And then, as I said, um, Anna and, and, and others think about this kind of either gene, gene targeted or agnostic screening for novel therapeutics, which we won't talk about today because it depends on the presence of uh, robust cellular assays here to actually screen for drugs. So that is how we kind of break down from the steps to drug discovery and development. We do need to partner with pharmaceutical companies both here and here, and we're doing that on an active basis. And so moving on um, from the introduction, um, Dorothy, as I said, will talk about um, the clinical features and Tess Levy, our, our genetic counselor, will present some of the data there. Celia will talk about uh, the mouse models, Huda, we're very happy to have Huda Zogby, who is a world expert on Rett syndrome, discovered the gene for Rett syndrome, and has really led over the course of the past couple of decades, um, the, made a roadmap of how to, how to go from a gene to, to novel therapies and a rare genetic disorder. As you probably know, Rett syndrome also affects primarily girls. Um, and Huda will join us at two o'clock and present some of her work. And I think it's a nice roadmap for understanding what we'd want to do in DDX3X syndrome. And Rebecca Pollock or uh, Becky Pollock will present at the end on stem cell research. Um, and I won't come back to the slide, but I will introduce people very briefly before each talk. So let me start um, by again, thanking you and um, reminding you to use the Q&A if you have any questions. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Dorothy Grice, who's a child and adolescent psychiatrist, who is one of, who's been leading the uh, clinical prospective clinical assessment in DDX3X syndrome. So I'll turn it over to Dorothy and I will stop sharing. Hi everyone, just getting my slides set up here. Is the audio okay? Yes. Audio is good? Yes, all right, great, okay. So we should actually say, um, I should say welcome to our afternoon of learning on DDX3X for these, those of us who are on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. Um, so we'll be starting with talking about clinical research in DDX3X. I'm gonna give you a very mini background on DDX3X syndrome, then I'm gonna pass the so-called Zoom baton over to Tess Levy, our genetic counselor, and she will summarize our clinical research to date. And as Joe mentioned, at the end, we'll have time for a few questions. Oops, okay. So just by way of background, um, the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Study, or the DDD, um, 
in 2015 published a paper and they noted um, in their introduction that despite three decades of successful, mainly phenotype driven discovery of the genetic causes of monogenic disorders, up to half of children with severe developmental disorders of probable genetic origin remain without a genetic diagnosis. And this is important because as Joe mentioned, a genetic diagnosis really supports biologically driven studies into the etiology and the mechanisms of these disorders and informs more specific treatment development. So it's very important to identify genes if at all we can. So why am I not going forward over here? My apologies. Okay, so in this study, they looked at 1,100 children with developmental disorders and did a meta-analysis also that included an additional 2,300 individuals. And you can see here in this figure on the left that their approach successfully, quote unquote, rediscovered about 20 known genes, which they have in red, but also several new genes in black that were associated with uh, developmental disorder syndromes. And so this was the first large scale study that put DDX3X on the map in this way. And it's very important uh, to the field. And in 2017, the same uh, DDD, the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Study Group, um, did this paper. And the goal of this study was to understand the prevalence of de novo mutations. So those are mutations that happen um, spontaneously in the individual. They're not inherited from the biological mother or the biological father. So they wanted to understand the role of de novo mutations in developmental disorders. And they had a cohort of about over 4,000 individuals to study. And in this work, they identified several genes, including DDX3X, you see here um, in this figure, that when mutated lead to developmental disorders. And so this study really uh, showed us that DDX3X mutations um, and DDX3 syndrome was a not uncommon syndrome out there that had not previously really been kind of coalesced as a, as a particular genetic syndrome. And since that time, there's been a lot of very interesting work done on DDX syndrome and on DDX3X gene. For example, Lennox et al, using both human and mouse genetics, identified 107 mutations in the gene. And they showed that DDX3X is essential for cortical or central nervous system or brain development. And their work showed also a correlation between uh, missense mutations, which uh, in our next talk test will define for you uh, briefly, polymicrogyria, which is um, abnormal folding of the brain cortex during development, and the most severe clinical outcomes. So this approach supports the potential of predicting severity or predicting clinical outcomes based on specific genetic or biological findings. So for our studies of DDX3X, we knew that, we all know that the typical characteristics of DDX3X syndrome, right? They include intellectual disability, tone abnormalities, movement abnormalities, developmental delay, and neurobehavioral difficulties. And these occur, of course, across a spectrum of from mild to severe. And many um, individuals with ddx syndrome also have other medical conditions. And previous studies um, often had access to more limited phenotypic or clinical information. And the methods lacked direct detailed in-person assessments, particularly as it relates to the neurobehavioral aspects and developmental aspects of the syndrome. And we do know that behavioral and neuropsychiatric symptoms are best studied by expert clinicians who can provide gold standard and direct clinical and research assessments to yield more accurate information about the syndrome. So our work was published just last month in Molecular Autism, a perspective in detailed behavioral phenotyping in DDX3X syndrome. And the goal of our work is to further detail the specific neurobehavioral manifestations of DDX3X syndrome and to identify the specific aspects or markers or so-called biomarkers of DDX3X syndrome that relate to either genetics or to severity. And these markers could then be tracked over time to follow severity. So for example, in a case of an interventional trial or a treatment trial, does a marker of severity decrease with treatment? That would be a really good indication that the treatment was on the right track, right? And it was an appropriate and effective treatment for DDX3X syndrome. We also think about markers that may help us to translate our lab-based work to our clinical research and vice versa. So are there markers or features that we find in the clinical side of things that can be translated to our studies of lab-based models that Sylvia, Sylvia will be talking about you in the next talk? Or are there certain types of mutations that correlate with particular features of the syndrome? And if so, it would help us understand kind of what goes off course when mutations do occur in the gene and on point us toward developing more biologically and genetically informed treatment. 
So I'm going to pass the baton to Tess Levy now, uh, who will summarize our recent work, and I'm going to stop my screen share. Tess, it's to you. Thank you. Um, let me know. Do you guys see the correct view on this? No. We see the, yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'll be giving a brief overview of the clinical research we've done so far in DDXX syndrome at the Siever Center. Um, so far, we have seen 24 participants with DDXX syndrome for deep phenotyping. The first 15 of these were in person visits. Typically, we would have individuals and their families come into the Siever Center for about three days of in-person assessments. Um, last year, for obvious reasons, we had to stop these in-person assessments. So we spent the spring and the early summer of last year working to develop these hybrid visits where we transferred as many assessments as we could to um, remote administration so we could continue our study. So the hybrid visits uh, consist of about three days of remote assessment, and then we pl plan to bring these individuals in for about a one-day in-person visit for all the assessments that we can't do remotely. Um, so nine individuals have started their hybrid visits. All nine have completed the remote portion, and so far one has completed the additional in-person portion to complete their hybrid visit. Um, we plan to bring in the remaining eight kind of as uh, guidelines are eased and as families are comfortable getting on a plane and traveling again. Um, also during this time where we haven't been able to see as many participants as we would have hoped, we worked on analyzing the, the data from the first 15 that we did see. Um, and as Dorothy mentioned, we have published our first DDX3X phenotyping uh, manuscript in molecular autism. Um, this is just a brief overview of our phenotyping protocol. I won't go into all of the measures, but the main domains that we look at are in intellectual and adaptive functioning, motor functioning, language and communication, autism and sensory symptoms, behavioral medical comorbidities, and biomarkers. Um, on the right, you see the individual measures that go into these domains. All of them that have a star next to them are ones that we are now able to do remotely, and those without a star are ones that we are not able to do remotely. Um, we chose a few of these to highlight for you today and go over some of the data from all 24 individuals that we've seen so far. Um, First, quickly, some demographics. So we have seen 24 individuals. They range from three to 16 years old, with the average age being eight. Uh, we've seen one male and 23 females. Uh, down on the right is a diagram of the DDX3X gene, which with each individual's mutation or genetic variant mapped onto the gene. Um, all of the mutations or variants that you see above are individuals we saw in person and that are published in our manuscript. And those below are the ones that either have uh, started or completed their hybrid visits. Um, you can also see that there are different colors of variants. So the one in the brown uh, tan color are called protein truncating variants. And those in blue are either missense or in-frame deletions. Um, I will read those a bit more when we talk about the um, genotype phenotype associations that we published in our first manuscript. Um, one of the first pieces of information that we collect from all of our families is developmental milestones. So a few that we chose to highlight were walking independently or walking alone. Um, in our cohort, 88% of individuals achieved this milestone and 12% did not. Um, below that, you see the age at achievement. So here the y-axis is age in months when the skill was achieved. Each blue dot represents an individual and then the blue bar represents the average for the cohort. Um, so you can see that it took on average about two years for individuals to be able to walk independently. Um, other milestones that we ask are for language. Uh, so in our cohort, just over a third of participants were nonverbal. 17% had words, but not phrases. And the remainder had both words and phrase speech. Um, again, below is the age at achievement. So for those who achieved a uh, first single word, it tended to be just over two years old. Um, and then for individuals who achieve phrase speech, it tended to be about uh, 40 to 45 months old. Um, but you can see quite a big uh, spread and variability here. So some individuals develop phrase speech early and 
There was one individual you can see that took over 80 months to develop this, but did end up achieving the skill. Um, this is the Vineland 3, which we'll talk about a few times today. Um, this is a measure of adaptive functioning, which is how we use our skills in everyday life. Uh, cognitive and adaptive functioning impairments are the defining features in intellectual disability. And to receive a diagnosis of intellectual disability, there must be impairments in both of these domains. Um, to differentiate the types of testing a bit, there is cognitive testing that you can think more of as, can you do this skill? And then adaptive testing looks more at, do you and can you use a skill independently in everyday life? Um, on the right-hand side, you see the results from the Vineland. Uh, so the y-axis here is the score, where the higher the score indicates higher abilities. Um, again, each blue dot represents an individual score, and the blue bars represent the average for the cohort. Um, so you can see that overall the cohort scored um, highest in the socialization domain. Some of the questions that are asked here um, are, does the individual show affection to familiar people? Can they play interactively? Do they use words to express distress rather than screaming or hitting? Um, and the cohort overall tended to struggle the most in the communication domain. Some of the questions here ask, can um, the individual follow instructions and can they say one or two word um, requests? The domains that fell in the middle are daily living skills. Some of the questions here are, can they feed themselves with a utensil? Can they prepare a simple snack? Do they look both ways before crossing the street? Um, and then the motor domain asks things like, can they safely get off an adult sized chair? Can they open doors using a doorknob? Um, and then at the end, you see adaptive behavior and that's a composite of all the domains put together. Um, motor functioning is a domain that we administer quite a few assessments in. One that we chose to highlight is in visual motor integration or the coordination of visual perception with fine motor control. Um, on the right hand side, you see an example of a visual motor integration task where the top row um, is a sample and then the individuals are asked to copy what they see. Um, on the left, you see the results in our cohort. Um, again, the higher the score, the higher the ability. Um, the dotted line you see at 50 is the threshold for visual motor integration disorders. So the 11 participants below that threshold met for a visual motor integration disorder and everyone above did not. Um, looking at the Vineland, so within the motor domain, there are two subdomains of gross and fine motor. Here, each pair of dots represents one individual score, where the blue dot represents their gross motor score and the red dot represents their fine motor score. Um, so this is to visualize that for individuals who had a big difference between their results, they typically showed uh, greater gross motor skills than fine motor. Um, receptive and expressive language and communication in general is another domain that we administer a handful of assessments, both because of the interest in research, but also um, to the parents and families. Um, I'll also be uh, showing um, the different types of assessments we administer. The first one will be an example of a direct evaluation where a, a clinician will um, administer an assessment with the individual with DDXX syndrome. The second example will be a caregiver interview where a clinician interviews a caregiver. And the third is a caregiver questionnaire where the caregiver completes it independently. Um, so the first is the direct evaluation. The PPVT is a direct evaluation of receptive language and the EVT is a direct evaluation of expressive language or expressive vocabulary. Um, again, here, each pair of dots represents one individual. The blue dot is their receptive score and the red dot is their expressive score. So here, what you're, you're able to see is that individuals who had different scores tended to have increased receptive vocabulary skills and expressive vocabulary. The next are the subdomains within the violent communication domain. So again, there's receptive and expressive language scores. And where you see a big difference, the individuals tended to have greater receptive scores than expressive scores. And then the third, which is an example of a caregiver questionnaire, is called the NCDI. This questionnaire asks parents about 400 vocabulary words, and they answer if their child understands, produces both or neither. Um, and again, where you see a big difference between um, the individual's two scores, you can see that most individuals can understand many more vocabulary words than they're able to produce. Um, so these, these three um, evaluations together can show overall in our cohort, 
individuals tended to have greater receptive vocabulary or receptive language than expressive vocabulary and expressive language. Um, sensory symptoms is a domain that we've recently been looking into more and more. Um, sensory symptoms are a key feature in autism, but also recently they've been shown in various neurodevelopmental disorders, even in kids who don't have autism. Um, so for that reason, we administered the sensory assessment for neurodevelopmental disorders or the SAND, um, which is both an observation and a caregiver interview to all individuals with DDX3X syndrome, not just those who have autism. Um, here, there are domain scores of hyperreactivity or increased responses to stimuli. Some examples here are individuals who don't like the sound of a blender or don't like the feeling of tags on clothing. Um, hyporeactivity, which is under responsiveness to stimuli. Some examples are not noticing when their name is called or not noticing um, when they get hurt. And then seeking behavior, which is when individuals can seek out sensory input. Some examples are individuals who bring toys right up to their eyes or their ears, or they hold or rub certain objects. Uh, so in our cohort, we saw sensory symptoms overall in individuals with ddx vx syndrome. And overall, the cohort scored highest in the seeking domain, indicating more seeking symptoms, and lowest in the hyporeactivity domain, indicating not as many hyporeactivity symptoms. Um, this shows consensus diagnoses of both autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. Um, so for autism, to make a consensus diagnosis, we use a psychiatric evaluation and then two gold standard assessments, the autism diagnostic interview or the ADI and the autism diagnostic observation schedule or the ADOS. Um, the first two of these can be done remotely, but the third cannot. And so the pie chart you see here is based on our published cohort of all the individuals we saw in person. Um, so 60% met for diagnosis of autism, while 40% did not. Um, for ADHD, we saw that 41% of individuals met for a diagnosis of ADHD and 59% did not. These consensus diagnoses are based off of uh, the same psychiatric evaluation a review of records by the study psychiatrist and also a team discussion with all of the clinicians that met the individual or the family. Um, medical comorbidities. So this is something that's commonly reported throughout all of the um, publications on ddx x syndrome and our study um, reflects similar findings. So there's a wide um, array of medical features seen in these individuals. Some of the more common ones are gait abnormalities, hypotonia, gastrointestinal problems, and some of the more rarely reported, but still much um, more frequent in individuals with ddx 3 x syndrome compared to the general population are things like hypertonia, which is increased tone and seizures. Um, and then lastly, we will look briefly at genotype phenotype associations, which we published in our most, uh, in our current manuscript. Um, so on top is a reminder of that genetics figure that we looked at. Um, so the ones in brown or tan are called protein truncating variants. These are genetic variants that end the gene early, which causes the protein to be truncated. Uh, the missense and inframe deletions are in blue, and these don't end the gene early, but they change one amino acid or one aspect of the gene, therefore changing the protein. Um, we separate our, our cohort into these two groups, and we compare them to see if there was any clinical differences. The purpose of this is to see if any specific genetic factor or a type of genetic factor can either predict or be associated with specific features of the syndrome or severity of the syndrome. Um, it can help us explain the variability that we see within these individuals and also help us personalize treatment and management even further within this condition. Um, below is a graph that is pulled from our manuscript, which shows differences in the developmental quotients. This data is what comes out of the cognitive evaluation. Um, so on the right-hand side of this, you can see that the um, protein truncating group showed significantly higher scores in the verbal developmental quotient compared to the missense group. Um, so using this, we're also going to be looking further into these associations as we see more and more individuals with ddx syndrome. Um, and then some future steps. So these are all the um, things that we're working on now. The first is developing a network of expert phenotyping sites, which would also act as future clinical trials network. Um, we are writing another manuscript to be published, which is a practice parameters paper. This will be summarizing findings cl for clinicians to support appropriate assessments and interventions for individuals with DDX3X syndrome. Uh, we're 
expanding recruitment of our studies to study uh, the genotype phenotype correlations or associations even further. Um, and we're laying the groundwork for a longitudinal study of DDX or X syndrome so we can assess the clinical features, the neurobehavioral features, and the medical concerns over time. And that is it so far. So I will pass off to Joe. I'm not sure if we're taking questions now or at the end. I think we'll take a few questions now. So if you want to stay on, and Darth, if you want to uh, turn on your camera, and maybe we can um, uh, stop sharing the slides just for simplicity. So a reminder, please use the Q&A to ask questions. Um, and uh, one of the questions was about uh, the presentations that will be recorded and they will be shared live. Uh, so they will be shared online. As a result, we are not gonna identify anybody who asks the question because um, it is not our, it's not our role to disclose who's participating. Um, so the, the, the questions that we will share will be shared anonymously. And we'll take some now. And as I said, there'll be a time in the discussion, Q&A to take more questions. So one of the questions that I'm sure several people are, would like to know the answer to is whether we are still accepting candidates for the prospective studies and um, also international participants who might be able to do the remote part, but maybe not the in-person part. So Dorothy, you wanna take that, you wanna take that to start with? Sure. So yes, uh, definitely we're still accepting um, folks that want to be in our study. You know, Tess mentioned some of the changes in our approaches due to the pandemic. And so that will obviously be changing over time, we hope, to get as things get more safe and relaxed across the United States, but also globally. In terms of international participants, we have to be um, a little selective due to the costs of, of travel and, of course, the, the risks associated with travel at this point. And we're really kind of focusing now on genotype phenotype associations is the focus. So if anyone is interested in joining our study, please feel free to contact us and sign up. We then ask you to share a genetic report, um, which you've already should have in your hand that led to the DDX3X identification. And then you can join the wait list and we can update you on um, expansion of the protocol and whether we're doing remote or direct or the hybrid and how that would go. Thank you. And Tess, uh, here's one for you that I'm going to rephrase. Um, as, as you know, the main transcript or the main protein product that we look at has 662 amino acids or 661. And are, are, are there instances where um, you know, the protein is elongated and how would that happen? Um, yes, I think that we, we have a few examples of those. Um, so before when we were talking about tr protein truncating variants or when a genetic variant causes the gene to end early, um, that's um, caused by a change of a base that um, has the reading frame of, of telling the gene to being stopped. Um, there's also mutations or variants that can, instead of having the stop, changes the stop to tell the body to keep reading through. And so that can cause the gene to be elongated. Um, I don't think that we've seen in person or remotely any individuals that have this, but I know we do have a few on our waiting list that we're hoping to be able to see soon. Yeah, so I, I think that's so yes, I think if I can add to that, it, it can happen and it's like any mutation, each individual mutation is going to be rare. And so, but there are almost certainly will be, you know, a proportion of cases where the protein extent that the length of the protein extends a bit longer either because the stop codon uh, changes something else and so you get keeps on reading or because there's a frame shift near the end that leads to a longer tail. Right? So it can happen. Um, and um, to answer the specific question that was asked, we certainly have some on our wait list. So um, one of the questions that I think is an important one uh, is the point that, you know, Many of the people who come through, and, and perhaps even most or all of them, have had intensive therapy, whether it's speech, PT, OT. And how does that affect the assessments that you do? This is a critical question, right? Because we want, certainly it's true that um, even we've heard from families we've seen in the past that their child has made gains and made progress in areas. And it's just so wonderful to hear that. 
And what we want to know, of course, and as you all do too, of course, is what are the particular interventions that are give us you know, the most bang for our buck? What's going to be most of, you know, effective and helpful for my child? And part of that is doing a longitudinal study where you can see developmentally what happens over time and also think about ways to control for interventions that are going on. Right now, we don't really have um, specific studies that help us answer that question. But I think it's a really, really important question because you want to invest in interventions and treatment that, that are going to be helpful. Yeah, thank you. And of course, the reality is that these interventions, as good as they are, they, you know, they probably won't make things go away completely uh, at this point. Right? So, so it is a confound, but it, it, it doesn't completely obscure the underlying uh, changes. So we have a question about biomarkers and um, maybe just, uh, it looks like it's a question from somebody who's an expert in the field, just to make it clear, a biomarker, we use that term to refer to things that may not be a clinical endpoint, may not be clinically what your doctor or your psychologist will look at, but might be something that measures, that's subclinical and measures a change very, um, you know, in a way that you can use it very usefully to see if things are getting, or, or getting better or worse over a short time span. And some of the most interesting biomarkers or most important ones are the ones that you can use both in a mouse and in an individual with a syndrome, because then you can study it in the mouse where studying the brain is a little bit easier. And then you can see if it, if it predicts the change, if it changes in the mouse, you can see if it also predicts changes in, in patients, and then it can be used as a clinical biomarker. So um, we didn't present anything on biomarkers today, but maybe Dorothy, do you wanna talk about some of the biomarker studies that are ongoing? Just what we, what's being done. So we're looking at, um, Jen Fosfig has been doing some interesting work with biomarkers and looking at um, book potentials and that type of thing. And so these are things that we do when folks come in and the SAND, I guess, did you have a slide on the SAND test? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So the SAND is also a different way to think about a marker, right? But again, thinking about ways we can quote unquote quantify, right? Or a discrete measurement of some aspect that's uh, central to the condition that we can track over time is really the way to think about it most broadly. Um, and so these are things that we're continuing to do as we um, see families uh, for the clinical based studies. Yeah, and I, and I do know that at least in a, internally in one of the um, one of our internal seminars within Mount Sinai, uh, Jen Fosfag and her team presented, uh, Sarah Barkley presented the results from EEG for the first, uh, for a small number of individuals. Um, and there were some interesting changes. One of the things we've discovered is since, since the biomarkers are the last thing that are done during the assessment, often um, the family is quite tired after being there for two, two or three, two, two and a half days. And so what we're gonna do now is probably get those biomarkers done a little bit earlier in the process especially since a lot of it's now being done remotely. So the, the in-person visit will be shorter. And we're really hoping, and I know Jen is really focusing on this, um, to get the biomarker studies, get a lot more bio information on biomarkers from a larger number of individuals. Okay, so uh, we're kind of running out of um, time, but one question is uh, where and how should we contact you to participate? So um, you can, of course, email, all the emails you receive from Rachel Cohen, you can respond to those. Uh, and and uh, I think we have a slide at the end, or we'll put up a slide at the end with contact information, or maybe we'll just put it in the chat. Um, and then um, there are quite a few other really interesting questions, which may be, um, many of which we can deal with in a kind of in a group setting, because I think there'll be different perspectives on it. So uh, thank you, Dorothy, and thank you, Tess. And maybe we'll move on to um, the next speaker, which is Sylvia Durube. And as I mentioned earlier, Sylvia is um, she's a she's a faculty member at Mount Sinai and the Department of Psychiatry and the Cyber Autism Center, and she's a molecular, cellular, and behavioral neuroscientist. And uh, she works in a preclinical team, uh, particularly focusing on animal models and cellular models for DDX3X syndrome. So um, we're very happy to have you, Sylvia, and the Cyber Center is very happy to have been able to bring Sylvia on as a faculty member. 
uh, to, to carry this important work forward. So Sylvia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen. Okay. Okay, you should see the, the presentation now. So um, thank you again for having me today. I'm really excited to uh, share the research that we have been doing with all of you. And thank you also to Dorothy and, and Tess for setting the stage so well for me. So as uh, Joe was alluding to earlier, um, my lab is focusing on understanding the developmental cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying DDX syndrome. So we are entirely focusing on these rare genetic condition. And so what I wanna do today with you is to share our uh, updates on a mouse model of DDX syndrome. But before sharing the data with you, I wanna go through why I think is important to have a mouse model. So what, what do we do with a mouse? So first of all, with the mouse model, we can study the mechanisms underlying a disorder. Having a, a mouse model or you know, any other experimental uh, living model helps us go from understanding the developmental and behavioral changes associated with the disorder, uh, dissect the brain circuits that are tied to these altered behaviors, within circuits being able to pinpoint to changes in individual brain cells, and then within brain cells look at molecular changes. So these are four tiers of investigations that are obviously very interconnected, and so each inform the others. Um, once we have a mouse model also, and once we have validated the mouse model, we can then use it as a preclinical tool for drug development and testing. So if we have identified specific behavioral deficits, changes in brain circuits, change in development of brain cells or molecular changes, we can all use those as benchmark for understanding whether a, um, you know, a drug candidate, for example, is ameliorating some of these changes. So what I've touched upon on this slide is the concept of validation. So let's see how we define validity for a mouse model. And again, this applies to other um, experimental models as well. Um, so the first level of validity is construct validity, being able to um, ensure that the, the model that we are creating recapitulates the, uh, the, the risk of that disorder. In our case, we're talking about a genetic disorder. And so what we are trying to achieve with cost validity is to really have a model that recapitulates the genetics of the human condition. So in our case, mutations in DDX3X that have been clinically associated with DDX3X syndrome. The next level of validity is phase validity, where we are looking at the um, manifestations of the mouse genetically engineered. And so, for example, if we were be looking here at a metabolic disorder associated with uh, obesity, we would be looking for phenotypes for, for manifestations that relate to that um, clinical um, sign. And so at phase validity, we are looking to make sure that our model recapitulates the manifestations of the disorder with all the due caution in trying and drawing parallelisms between human and mice. And then the third level of validity is predictive validity, where we are trying to ensure that the model that we have validated in terms of construct and phase um, aspects is also able to predict the ability of a drug candidate, of a potential drug in ameliorating um, some of the deficits that we have seen as I said, at all, all the levels that I've um, touched upon um, earlier. So let's first see what we have done to ensure cost of validity for our mouse model. So the first thing that I wanna say, and I'm glad that Tess explained so well the, the distinction between um, two classes, at least of mutations, so loss of function mutations, including frame shift and nonsense mutations, and on the other side, certain mean sense mutations. So I wanna clear up immediately that our model has closest validity for loss of function mutation. So those mutations that are leading to the loss of one of the two copies of the ddx 3 gene in girls. So to do so, we have genetically manipulated um, one of the building blocks of the ddx 3 gene that you see, the, the mouse one that you, that you see depicted here uh, at the bottom. 
So we have um, manipulated this, this part of the, this portion of the gene that is called exon 2, where you see many mutations clinically associated with the X-Rex syndrome line. So we have, fundamentally, we have um, created a way to take out this exon. And so um, take out one copy of the gene in females and the only copy of the gene in males. And the other uh, a trick I have to tell you about is that we have to manipulate ddx 3 x only in the embryo and make sure that we were not introducing perturbations in the placenta, because we know, at least in mouse, that ddx 3 x is fundamental for the biology and the development of the placenta. So when we generated these trans transgenic animals, we were expecting to see four classes of mice. Uh, typically developing males, so males with intact DDX3X expression that you're going to see represented always in yellow throughout my slides. Females with intact DDX3X, so these would be typically developing female pups in blue. Then female mutant pups, so these are females that have lost one of the two copies of the DDX3X gene. And then males that have lost the only copy of DDX3X that they have. And so as you can see here in this plot where we are seeing the, the percentage of the entire mouse population distributed across these four classes, you can immediately appreciate that we did not recover any male mutant pup. So pups embryos that have lost made embryos that have lost the only copy of DDX rex that they have die in utero. They, they, they are not even born. So in our study, we're gonna start in our work, we study female mutant pups and um, contrast them with their sisters and their uh, brothers. To make sure that these pups really have construct validity, we, may, we need, needed to make sure that as we designed them, they really lost one of the two copies of the ddx 3 gene. So we monitored the expression of ddx 3 x in the female mutant pups contrast, contrasted with their sisters and brothers. And as you can see here, we have looked at both the RNA and the protein. These female mutant pups really have a reduction in ddx 3 x So this mouse model has validity for mutations, for example, frame shift or nonsense mutations that lead to the loss of one of the two copies of ddx 3 x in girls. What about phase validity? Today, I'm going to show you just a, a part of the, of the test that we have run on, on these animals. The very first thing that we have done, since this is a developmental disorder, is looking at how the female mutant pups and their siblings uh, meet developmental milestones. So we have been following the development of these animals from the day they are born, um, was natal day one, basically the day after they are born, until they are juvenile. And so one of the very first thing that we did very simply was taking the body weight, because we know that the x 3 x girls can have a um, can can be small for their age and have low body weight. And as you can see here, the mutant female pups again here in red um, are always smaller than their sisters in blue and their brothers in in yellow. And this low body weight persists also when they are adults. So these are four months old um, mice, so adult mice. And you can see here how the mutant female adults have reduced body weight compared to their sisters. So this is reminiscent of the failure to thrive that we often see in patients with ddx 3 x syndrome. Uh, we also see other uh, physical delays, for example, a delay in eye opening. Here we are monitoring at what age, at what postnatal day, these animals are opening their eyes. And you can see that the ddx 3 x mutant female pups have a delay in opening their eyes. And this translates into a sensory deficit. So they have a delay in developing the ability of placing themselves based on visual cues. And as you rem may remember from Tess's presentation, the, the um, sensory profiling really is something that we are looking uh, more in detail in individuals with ddx syndrome as well. The visual domain is not the only impacted. Uh, we also see a delay in, um, in developing a reflex to auditory stimuli. Again, you see how the mutant female pups have a delay in acquiring uh, these auditory um, subtle response and a delay in responding to touch, so to tactile um, stimuli. 
Mutant female pups also have motor delays. Again, I'm gonna show you only two of the tests that we have run. The first one is called surface riding, where we are measuring the time that it takes for um, pups to flip on the four poles from a supine position. And so you see that the mutant female pups uh, need longer times to be able to flip on the four poles. And this is indicative of hypotonia. Also, they have a delay in acquiring an innate behavior called negative geotaxis, which is the ability of reorienting their body axis when placed on a 45 degree slanted surface head down. So they basically have a delay in responding to, the, to these vestibular cues of gravity and uh, being able to turn and walk all the way up the surface. So, so far we have seen that female mutant pups have physical, sensory, and motor delays. What about the manifestations when these animals are adults? We have tested other cohorts of animals because uh, here we are separating the pups every day uh, from their moms. And as much as we minimize this maternal separation, we know that that acts as a confounder. So on separate courts of animals, we have tested emotional states, cognition, social behavior, and motor behavior. So one of the very first tests that we run um, is called open field test. This is a pretty naturalistic uh, approach to really measure the motor and um, activity and anxiety levels in a mouse when it is placed in an open arena. So animals have um, evolu evolutionarily developed a response to avoid predators. So they avoid the center of this open arena. So what you're seeing here at the bottom are the, the traces, the, the actual video track traces of a typically developing mouse, female mouse, and a mutant female mouse. So you see how they move in the arena. And so we mm, measure a series of parameters. And the first thing we notice is that the uh, mutant females move more, travel more than their, um, um, than, than their sisters. So in spite of the motor delays, they have hyperactivity. Also, when we look at uh, how they deal with this you know, uh, anxiety um, eliciting uh, center of the arena, we see that the DDX, 3X mutant females take longer to decide to enter the center zone. And once they're there, they spend less time in it. And so these are signs of anxiety related behaviors. So where we're seeing both hyperactivity and anxiety. We also measured um, memory uh, using a paradigm called fear conditioning. So what we are doing here is testing the ability of animals to recall, to, to first learn an association between a tone and a mild food shock during a phase that is called training. Um, okay, so what you're seeing here is the response of a mouse to this training, right? Where a tone is gonna be followed by a mild food shock. And the response, the, the fear response of a mouse is measured as freezing behavior. So you can see here again in red that the mutant females are indistinguishable from their sisters, indicated that they can properly learn that the, the, um, the tone is gonna be followed by a mild food shock. 24 hours after we measure how well they remember that this is the very same environment where they got shocked the day before. So we are here measuring contextual fear um, memory. And so what you, what you can see again in red is that the mutant females have a weaker recall, weaker first recall of the fear memory. So they don't remember as well as their sisters that this is the same environment where they got shocked the day before. This memory deficit is specific to context as instead they remember very well that the tone is gonna be followed by a shock because they freeze as much as their sisters when placed in a completely new environment but being administered with the tone. So cognitive deficit. We also measure motor function because as I said, uh, the motor um, delays are very prominent in the pups and also from the patient populations, we have learned that both motor delays and motor adult deficits are present. So we have tested adult animals at four months. Also all the other tests that you've seen before 
cognition and open field were run at four months. And so here I'm again showing you only one of the tests that we have run. This is called vertical pole test, where we are measuring the balance and motor coordination of mice when they are walking on a vertical pole, turning on the top of this pole, and then descending the pole. So what we are seeing at four months is that the, uh, the, um, the mutant females have a deficit, so they have, uh, it takes them longer to descend, so they have a, um, a, a difficulty in descending the pole. And then given our stunning questions on the longitudinal trajectory of some of these deficits in adult, we also decided to test another group of animals, uh, one year old. So these are animals that were kept for one year, um, and so they are aging animals. And so what we saw on this, on this separate group of animals was a, a more pronounced um, uh, motor deficit. So not only the animals had a higher, took them longer to be able to descend the pole, but they also had problems turning on top of the pole. So we asked the next question whether, um, because these animals here were kept naive, naive for one entire year, so they were not subjected to any testing. We asked the questions whether prior behavioral training could alleviate some of this motor decline. And so we tested a group of animals that had been tested also at four months old, so that they had been exposed prior um, to behavioral training. And what we are seeing here is that this prior exposure to training now alleviates the motor decline. So, so far what we're seeing is that adult mutant females have hyperactivity, anxiety, uh, fear of memory deficits, as well as motor um, problems. What are the brain regions implicated in these, in all of these manifestations? So we went back at the early postnatal age, because again, this is a developmental disorder. So we wanna make sure that we capture deficits that happen early on. And so together with the lab of Jason Lurch at Sick Kids in Canada, we have performed MRI on uh, postnatal day three pups, both typically developed pups and mutant uh, pups. So these are all females. And what we saw was about a 10% reduction in the overall brain weight, in the overall brain uh, volume, sorry. So these animals have a, low, a, a, a smaller brain, but this is in line with their overall um, uh, low body weight. So this is a not, not a pure microcephaly phenotype, is rather in line with the fact that they are small for their age. But even within this 10% of reduction, we see certain brain regions that are disproportionately smaller. And interestingly, some of these brain regions really correlate with the behavioral deficits that we have seen earlier. For example, the amygdala, that is very important for fear response. So one of the regions that popped up in our analysis was the cerebral cortex, and this is the region where we are now focusing a lot. So this is the sort of the outer region of the, of the brain. And the reason we focus on this uh, region is twofold. First of all, the, the, the cerebral cortex really is the director of this orchestra, right? So it, it really is the place where higher brain functions uh, reside. And second, as um, Dorothy was also mentioning, individuals with edx syndrome can have congenital brain malformation suggesting that cortical development is altered. So we're now doing a lot of experiments to really look through the brains of um, the mutant females uh, by sectioning them and then staining for specific populations of nerve cells that are very beautifully organized in the cerebral cortex. And these different nerve cells project to different brain areas, either within the cortex or to subcortical regions. So assessing them really help us understand if there are deficits in connectivity in the brain. So I just wanna give you uh, one piece of our evidence. So one population that we see here impacted is po this population that you see here in red. You can see how in the mutant female brains, this population resides in deeper layers than they in the typically developing females. And this population projects to subcortical areas that are very important for motor control. So again, a correlation between cellular changes and behavioral changes. And now we are doing a lot of experiments to really try and understand whether this population and others that we are finding affected are projecting in an abnormal way um, to other regions of the brain. 
So just to sum up what we are seeing here by monitoring really the development of the behavior of and the, and the cellular phenotypes of these animals from birth to aging, we are seeing that during the first 21 days, so from birth to juvenile age, uh, female pups have a delay in reaching physical, sensory, and motor milestones. A postnatal day three, so when they're pups, they also have a reduction in brain volume with some regions, including the cortex disproportionately affected and deficits in cortical lamination. And then at four months, they have hyperactivity, anxiety, memory deficits, and motor impairments that exacerbate further a one-year-old unless animals are subjected to prior training. So this is the work of a very talented group of trainees in the lab that I feel fortunate and uh, you know, very proud to work with. And so the work was led by Marta Garcia Forner, postdoc in the lab, and um, alumna Andrea, Andrea Botnot, who is now uh, at UT Southwest and continuing to work on DDX syndrome. And you see the other uh, people who participated in this work and more broadly work on DDX syndrome here. And then I also want to acknowledge all the other. Um, uh, co collaborators on this work, especially Jason Larch and Jacob Elgood for the MRI, Dorothy for important information on the clinical spectrum. As uh, Joe was mentioning, we work very closely to make sure that preclinical and clinical work uh, gets integrated. Joe, of course, uh, a previous uh, faculty, senior faculty, Elodie Drapeau, and Rocco Ras in uh, Rutgers University. And thank you for all our funders. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for a great talk. Um, we have a couple of minutes for, for a couple of questions, and of course, there'll be a longer time at the end. Um, and one of the questions is about going back to the different kinds of mutations that we were talking about from the, from the you know, participant-based studies or the, or the clinical studies. And so the question is, do you see any difference between missense or truncating variants in the mice? So we are not able to answer that question because our mouse only models um, mutations that lead to the loss of one of the two copies of the gene. So it's, it's not modeling missense mutations, but we are aware of other two models that are being generated um, with missense mutations. And so we hope that as soon as those models become available, we will be able to um, fundamentally run all these tests side by side and really try and understand convergences and divergences between models that have loss of function mutations and models that have missense. sense. So the short answer is that we hope to do, be able to do that soon, but we, we, we were not able because our mouse has uh, loss of function mutations. And I, I know one of the things you've been focusing on, on also is taking the mouse that's missing DDX3X and putting different mutations back. Yes. So what do you, so are you seeing any differences there? Yeah, so what we are doing with that work is creating a cellular model of missense mutations. And so we have been modeling both mutations found in females and mutations found in males. And we definitely see differences between these two categories, but the, the work is still preliminary. So I hope I'll be able to share more um, next time. And of course, as you said, that's in that's in the petri dish. It's not in the right, exactly. It's not in the in the in the mouse. So we're not able to assess behavior and development. And 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 to kind of to to foreshadow Rebecca's talk, obviously with the patient derived stem cells, one can do the same kinds of things with uh, hum, human mutations in the human context in human neurons in the petri dish, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, and one of the another interesting question is, you know, th there are a few males with the syndrome, as you know, and so why is it with the mice there are no males surviving? Yeah, so the mutations that we have that the community has identified so far in male patients are all missense mutations, while in our mice, so so the, the protein is being made, the DDX3X mutant protein is probably may, being made, but what we hypothesize is that that protein is working less well than it should in males. While in the mice, what we have done is completely removing the DX3X. So that is where we think the, the this, uh, difference uh, comes from, right? So in, the, in our mouse model, we have completely removed the DX3X in the males. So the males 
die even before the brain is beginning to form. So this really speaks volumes about the, the fundamental function of DDX3X for development. While in the male patients, um, they only have missense mutation. So we think that their DDX3X protein is there, it's just functioning not as well as it should. And I guess that goes back to some of the conversations we had with the clinical group, which is that there appear to be different classes of mutations for DDX3X. And I know that uh, Tess and Dorothy talked about the missense and the protein truncating, but it sounds like from what you're saying and some of the work that uh, the other groups have done, that within the missense, there are some of, some of the mutations are working, that the protein is there, but working less well. Correct, yes. Sometimes the protein may be there, but not working at all. And sometimes the protein may be there and actually be working in a way that's maybe even more harmful. Yes, absolutely. So this is the, the landscape that is emerging where we have missense mutations that might be what we say hypomorphic, so working, but not as well as they should, and other missense mutations that might be leading to a gain of function. So now the protein is doing something that it is not supposed to be doing in the cells. Right. Yeah, and so I think that really speaks to why it's so important in the clinical group to start looking at what we call genotype phenotype, right? Looking at the different classes of mutations and see how they predict the ultimate outcome. Yeah. And uh, there was a question now about this question of some of the missense mutations being dominant negative. And I think you just explained yes. that. Right? The missense yeah. can be hypomorphic, which is low activity. They can be gain of function where they pick up a new property, which could be bad or, or, or sometimes good, or there could be loss of function, where even it's, if it's a missense, the protein is not working. Right? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia, and, and, and you. your excellent team. So I am going, I, it's a great pleasure to introduce Huda Zogby. Huda Zogby um, is really world famous, so it doesn't do her justice. Uh, she's been involved in developmental disorders and neurogenetics for, 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 a, for a long time. Uh, she's really discovered genetic basis of multiple uh, neurological disorders. And this, as I think you'll hear, has led to, um, just as Dorothy mentioned, some insight into what's changing, what is the mechanism that leads to the particular disorder. And then once you know that mechanism or that pathway, does it lead to better treatments. And, and, and I think uh, Rett syndrome is an example that I think we take as a roadmap um, for DDX3X syndrome. Uh, Dr. Zogby uh, trained um, over hundred scientists and physician scientists. She's a member of the National Academy, National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. These are two of the top academies in, in the USA. Um, it's kind of, I once explained it to somebody that it's like the uh, hall of fame, it's where your peers uh, elect you to, to as one of the top individuals in science or medicine, and she's in both of those uh, organizations. And she's also an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she's received many, many prizes and, uh, and honors. Um, and uh, just most recently, she re received the Brain Prize, and I was very honored to be able to speak at that at the uh, meeting that hosted her and presented her with the Brain Prize for her work on Rett syndrome. So Huda, thank you for taking time. I know you made a special effort to join us today uh, because of your, um, I, I, would, I, I, I won't embarrass you, but because of your deep concern and love for families. And I know you made a special effort to come join us and uh, thank you for doing that and look forward to your talk. Thank you, Drew. Thank you so much for inviting me to this meeting. And thanks for all the family who joined us today. And special thanks to Rachel Cohen, who helped uh, you know, navigate our schedules. I must say, I went to the DDX3X Foundation uh, last week. And I just was really touched reading all the stories of all the beautiful uh, girls, mostly girls, uh, affected by this syndrome. So I learned a lot. And I appreciate that you put me in this talk right after Sylvia because she gave a really beautiful talk about the animal model that she's developed. And I hope, although I work on Red Syndrome, I hope when I share with you what we've learned from Red Syndrome, there may be some tidbits that are helpful. And I noticed from your questions that perhaps because Red Syndrome has been around for a while uh, now, uh, 
we learned a little bit more that maybe some of these questions will be also answered and we can all learn together by sharing information. So with that, I will begin to share my slides. And, uh, and I just need Joe or someone to tell me you're seeing my screen and you're seeing my pointer. Yes, I see the screen and I see the pointer too. Wonderful, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, as I said, I, I prepared a talk that just summarizes some principles that you might find helpful as we think about the DX3X or other neurodevelopmental disorders. So Red syndrome, I put here my very first patient, the one who invite, inspired me after seeing her to go into science. I, I was really inspired because she had a healthy early uh, life and then lost all the milestones she learned. Her head growth slowed down, her language disappeared, all the words, the singing she used to do disappeared. And you see her here holding her hands, wringing them. Uh, instead of using them uh, well, which she used to do, and develop features of autism, balance problems, and uh, seizures and tremors, <clears throat> and eventually breathing problems and autonomic dysfunction. If you could see my office, I have a huge picture of Ashley, who is now about 43 years old. So she's, you know, and she actually smiles when she sees me. I know she recognizes me, which is wonderful. So RET, uh, like DDX3X, is a sporadic disorder. And you know, I saw Ashley in 1983, so it took us a while to find the gene. But uh, we finally discovered it in 1999 and found out it's actually at the, towards the end of the X chromosome. And it was a gene that made a protein that's called methylcytosine binding protein 2. This protein was initially discovered by Adrian Bird based on the fact it binds the cytosines, methylated cytosines. And uh, in that 1999, Ruthie Emir found it to be the gene that's mutated in Red syndrome. So um, like DDX3X, uh, the Red gene is on the X chromosome. Um, it's a little bit different in that it's in a region where um, one of the X's is always inactive. Uh, so genes expressed in that region active. So that means in a red brain, if you imagine healthy X, and you see that healthy X makes a protein shown here as purple dots, will make the protein, but the X with the mutation does not make the protein. So the brain is mosaic. And that's when you get the classic features of Rett syndrome. And the reason you see that is because, as many of you know, in females, there are two X chromosomes. And in order for a female to have the same amount of genes and proteins functioning as males, always in every cell, one of her X's has to be inactivated and it's random. But as I, as I learned that DDX3X actually is in a region that's not quite as robustly inactivated. Now, what we learned also is in the males that the total absence of the gene results in very severe disease and premature death. And you'll see uh, these males, unfortunately, severely encephalopathic motor problems and die by one to two years of age. But this is what 20 years of threat studies have taught us. It taught us, as you heard Sylvia talk about a hypomorphic mutation. What is a hypomorphic mutation? It's a mutation that's mild enough to inactivate the protein, but not so bad where you don't make a protein. You're still making the protein, and you see it here as a fainter protein in the sense that it functions. It does what it normally does, but just at a partially uh, decreased level. And what we learned in Red syndrome, when you have these mild mutations, you can actually see them now in males, and these males will survive. But unlike males that have a total loss of the protein, these males will have learning disability, and they may have any one of these psychiatric features, autism or anxiety, uh, hyperactivity and tremors, we see a lot of psychiatric features such as bipolar and early onset schizophrenia. So this gives you an idea that the milder the mutation, the more likely you are to see psychiatric features rather than the neurologic 
motor features and such. We also learned that increasing the gene uh, can be problematic. Uh, so here we created a mouse where we added one copy using the human gene to the mouse own gene. So now the mouse has one copy that it normally has and another one that we added and we find that these mice experience a lot of neurological problems, anxiety, learning problems, motor problems, stereotyped behavior, epilepsy and early death by one year of life. And this led us to suspect that maybe if that gene is doubled in human, it might cause disease. In this case, we only added the MACP2 gene. But then a year later, uh, Linda Vanesh and colleagues discovered that actually there are many humans that have duplications that span that part of the chromosome. They include many other genes, but always the one gene that's shared among them is MACP2 plus another small gene next to it that we don't quite know its function in the brain. But the fact that all the features we saw in the patients were reproduced in the mice lead us to believe it's really, it's the MACP2 dosage that matters. So what we learned then from all of these studies is that you have to have the level of this protein exactly right. If you totally lack it, it's very severe and fatal in males. Girls are mosaic, half of their cells have it. But we also learned, um, and we know this is what's happening in DDX3X, if you have 50% of the protein where you decrease it in all the cells, you also get neurological phenotype. And this is the very mild mutation that I shared with you can cause autism and psychiatric features. And males with this mutation will survive. Now the females with this mutation will not have any features. And this is very reminiscent of DDX3X, where whenever we have a male, typically the females, because the mutation is milder, don't show any symptoms. And we also know that doubling the level of the protein is bad. We even know that tripling it is even worse, both in humans and in mice. These humans sadly will die by one, uh, by one year of age. So recognizing that this is a gene that we have to have it just right, that its level really matter, we have recently decided to learn what might regulate the level of this gene in our cells. Typically for every gene, there's some uh, sequences of the DNA that other factors bind and regulate them. So we decided to use a technology that involves sequencing that looks at portions of our DNA that are open, which means the inscription factor can bind and direct the expression of the gene. And by doing so, we identified the promoter region. You see this big fat peak here that was already known to be important for the expression of MACP2. But then because we knew that MACP2 levels increase in the mature brain, we identify additional peaks that tell us those regions are also regulatory elements. But we didn't know these are candidates. We didn't know if they're really going to regulate the expression of this gene. And this was work done by my graduate student, Yin Yao, collaboration with our colleague at Baylor, Josh White, who had done developmental uh, sequencing um, to look at this, using this technology to look at open chromatin. And so to be sure that we test if any of those regions are important, we made deletion in the mouse of each of these candidate regions. And this is what we learned. If you look on this picture, you look at the normal MACP2 levels. And what I want you to see is this area. You can see how it's now reduced and you see here, it's about reduced by 30 or 40%. And then this other peak that when you delete it, now you increase the protein. So we looked at those two peaks and we found that those are actually also conserved in the human. In other ways, if you look at human data, human brain data, you find those regions are regions where transcription factors might bind. So we wanted to be sure that in the human neurons, these regions do affect the level of the protein. And this is where we use the technology that Joe was referring to when he talked about in vitro. So you saw the experiment in mice, but to bring it to human relevance, you then have to take cells from humans and convert them to neurons in the dish. 
and now these are neurons that are very similar to the neurons in the brain, and ask if we can come back and delete those two regions, do we change the level of the protein? And you'll see here the region that decreased the level of the protein in mice. You see here a healthy uh, neuron from a healthy uh, cell. And here's a neuron where we deleted this region that regulate the expression of MACP2. And you'll see there's reduction of MACP2 levels. On the other side, the same one that in the mouse increased the level of the protein, you'll see it here increasing the level of the protein. So this is important for two to three reasons, right? It's important that it told us that the, the same mechanism that regulate this gene is conserved between mice and humans, which is great. That tells you that mice can actually serve as a model organism to study as much as you want about this uh, gene. But it also told us that we can now take cells from humans with different mutations and study them functionally because we have a way to assay the protein. And I think this is what Joe was referring to in the last uh, session. Now, one thing that we learned that's really important is that we knew that in Rett syndrome, the Rett mice reproduced all the features of the syndrome. And you see that in the big blue oval. But when we delete the gene, the regulatory element that only reduces the protein from 100% to 70%, and we characterize these mice, we only get a, a partial feature of the disease. So it goes to show you that this 20% change, if you will, in the level of the protein will rescue most of the motor and learning and all of these phenotypes and keep you with some hyperactivity and psychiatric uh, phenotype. And on the other side, we knew that if you double the gene, you get all the features you see in this big oval. But if you increase it rather than it, rather than increasing it 100%, you only increase it 50%, now you get a subset of the features. So this is really important for many reasons. Now it tells us that those regions that we identified, they could be mutated in some individuals and they're gonna give a milder disease that we wouldn't recognize as Red syndrome, but now we should be looking for. The other good side of this, it tells us that when you're treating, you don't have, sometimes you hope to bring the, the gene back to normal, but sometimes you can't. And even if you brought it back to 70% of normal, look how much you rescue. And even here, if we decrease the toxic, the increased amount of the protein that causes neurologic problem by 50%, we're seeing a lot of benefits. So I think this really has taught us a lot and has important implications, uh, at least for this gene. Now, moving from genes to neurons and, and brain, we've learned that the MACP2 protein is important for every brain cell. Whenever you eliminate it from a brain cell, that brain cell's function is decreased. So we decided what would happen if we stimulate these brain cells and could that improve the performance of the, of the animal model? And for this, we decided to focus on the part of the brain that's important for learning and memory and to stimulate a region of the brain that projects and activate that part of the brain. So we stimulated what we call the fornix, which project to the hippocampus and will activate. So the area of stimulation is different from the area or where the activation happens. But this is the part of the brain important for learning and memory. And we do that in living, walking animals. This is really, although it feels invasive, it's like you do in Parkinson's disease for patients to help their tremors. So this is happening in humans all the time, the deep brain stimulation. And our colleague, Jen Rong Tang and his postdoc did this work. And I don't have time to show you all the results, but I'll tell you what they did. They took adult rat mice that are already symptomatic and they gave them one hour a day of this uh, deep brain stimulation using the same parameters that neurosurgeons use in the OR for other neurological diseases such as tremors or movement disorders and did that for 14 days and then waited four to five weeks and then examined all the things that we know are altered due to 
decrease activity of that part of the brain. So learning and memory, plasticity of the brain, and even neurogenesis, adult neurogenesis is decreased in rat mice. And of course, there were a lot of gene expression changes. And to our surprise, all of these corrected. It improved the hippocampal learning, uh, the plasticity normalized, um, synchrony patterns in these neurons, they began firing when they're supposed to normalize, and it normalized adult neurogenesis, it, uh, improved all the gene expression changes. So this was very, very exciting to us, and it told us that at least the red brain in mice is responsive to neurostimulation, and we have then gone on to explore, oh, my colleague, uh, Jen Rong has gone on to test this in another neurodevelopmental disorder, CDKL5. You probably have heard of that also on the X chromosome. And he also found out that deep brain stimulation improved the learning and memory in these uh, preclinical animal models. So this is exciting. It's going to take a little bit more work for us to think about translating this. And one of the challenges for us in the red field is that there's so many symptoms. So if you stimulate this area, well, how about the motor area? And how about the area that um, has to do with anxiety and so on and so forth? So we're testing now the motor area and one could implant in principle two stimulators, but I think we started thinking, could there be other strategies that may help Rett syndrome that may mimic deep brain stimulation. What deep brain stimulation is doing is increasing the activity of those neurons that I told you don't function properly. So we thought about intensive behavioral training as possibly an approach to change circuit activity. And we wondered if the timing of that training would be critical. So to this end, and I should mention there have been studies from the labs of Juan Young and Tony Hannan and Pizzo Russo. All of them have shown that enrichment in the red mice did improve behavior. Now, I know just like the parents of DDX3X children, red families really do a lot for their children as far as physical therapy and training. So we wondered if the timing is really what's important. If you did it before the symptoms develop, would that make a difference? So we first focused on a motor task where if the animals are on this rotating rod, they typically, the red mice will fall very quickly because they're uncoordinated. And typically they start getting problems around 12 weeks of age. By 16, they're falling very quickly. By 24 weeks, they can't even sit on the rotating rod. So if you put them four days on the rotating rod to train them, at 24 weeks, they just simply cannot uh, last on it. So uh, we decided that we were going to have to train them before the symptom onset, and we will train them after symptom onset and see, does it make a difference? So these were the two paradigms. If we train early, we did it every two weeks. So it wasn't very intense, just every two weeks, but it was repeated. So they got 18 sessions of training. And then we wanted to see what would happen if we did the 18 sessions after symptoms onset, which mimic sort of the physical therapy that, you know, families do after they learn of a diagnosis. And to our surprise, we found that the timing of training did actually make a big difference. So in black here, you see the healthy mice and you'll see the maximum they can last is about 200 seconds. But naive red mice just simply can't. I showed you that at that age, they are symptomatic. If we train them late, they did get some benefit. And we knew many of these trainings that we do on the girls have really improved their functionality. But it's nowhere as good as the early training. The early training was really dramatic and improved their functionality. And when we kept the early training, the functionality improved and lasted several months. So this was quite exciting, but we quickly learned that they were only good on this. When we test them for learning and memory, it was only this motor training that was helped. So we wanted to ask, what about if we train them for learning and memory? So for this, we used what we call a water maze test where you put the mouse in a pool and you hide 
the escape platform. The mice will not like being in the water. So they're going to keep searching till they find the platform. It's hidden, but they'll run into it. And then they'll start using the cues in the room, what's on the walls, to recognize that it's in this quadrant. So they'll immediately, after four sessions of training, they will quickly dash to that platform. Now, the red mice, unfortunately, do not have this capability. Even if you train them these multiple times, they will not do it. So we wanted here again to see, would early training make a difference? For this particular learning and memory assay, the mice are symptomatic at, at an early age, almost six weeks of age, they start showing you know, decreased learning and memory, and it, by 12 weeks, they're quite severe. So we decided to start at four weeks, train them as early as possible. So here we only had a window to do it twice, an extra training session. And we also did the post-symptomatic training to see if that makes a difference. And what you'll see here, I'm gonna walk you through this, is that we got a really very nice result. So let's first look at healthy wild type mice that have never been manipulated, just the usual four days. As I told you, they start, they don't know what the platform, but by four days, they go quickly to it. Now, if you took these healthy mice and did either early or late training on them, irrespective, they'll be very fast finding the platform. In contrast, the red animals, all that four sessions do is nothing. They still cannot find the platform. And if you did that late training, they still cannot find the platform. Sorry, the platform. However, if we train the red mice early, now they perform very similarly to the healthy mice. And this was really quite exciting. So this tell you they can now acquire the memory and that improve their ability to find the platform quickly. And then we do something to challenge them the next day after they learn how to find it, we take it away and we see, do they search the right area? Do they search the quadrant where the platform is? And if you look here, the healthy mice do search the right quadrant more often. 25% is chance because there are four quadrants. The late training is like chance, but the early training now improved and they perform closer to the healthy animal than to the um, late training. And also the ability to cross the area where the platform is, you see that the early trained animals do better. So this was quite exciting. Now we show in two different domains that you can train these animals and they can improve on the task. And we learned, I don't have time to show you the data, that the neurons engaged in this task actually improve their functionality. So to summarize then, we learned that pre-symptomatic training improves the motor and memory function in red mice, but in a task specific manner, which means you have to train them on a specific task repeatedly so they can get good at it. And that this continued training delays the onset of symptoms by several months in the mice. And that the, their neurons that mediate this task that improve their plasticity and physiology. So this is really important. For Rett syndrome, it has big implications because I told you in Rett syndrome, the children and the girls are born healthy. And typically after the first birthday, they start stagnating or lose a little bit of their milestones. The average time when a Rett diagnosis is made by DNA testing is about three years of age. So we have this whole window of opportunity here when the parents and families don't know the child has read, and particularly this period early on, the first year of life, when they're really functioning normally, that we might be able to use to do some early repetitive training. And our question is, if we had that knowledge, if there was newborn screening and we had that knowledge, might we delay the course of Rett syndrome? Might we even improve their functionality so that when we have more definitive therapies, that could really help them tremendously. And this is something, you know, we hope that with time as various organizations and uh, contemplate, you know, the value of newborn testing, we can do, and then we can do clinical trials and see if this early training is making a difference and compare that to the historical data we have from the natural history study 
that's beautifully studied thousands of red girls, one can see if we're really making a difference. Um, in the last three minutes, I just want to share with you what therapies we are pre preparing for the patients with the duplication. I told you that the duplication in mice causes severe phenotypes that mimic the human. And unfortunately, I forgot to mention uh, these males that have the duplication all typically die by the third decade, and it's a devastating disorder. So we wanted to ask if we normalize the protein level after symptom onset, could we reverse the symptoms and that could help? Could that help? Now, because we have too much protein, we can use something called antisense oligo, which is a small piece of DNA that binds the RNA and leads to its degradation, lowering the level of the RNA and the protein in the cell. So here, because we have too much, we can use this strategy. And for this, we collaborated with Ionis Pharmaceuticals to do that. And I'll just show you a couple of data slides where you can see these animals are hypoactive. You can see in this uh, middle uh, panel here, they don't move as much, but after the antisense oligo treatment, now they move as much and you'll see all their activities, their ability to stand on their hind legs improves almost back to normal level. And this work was done by Hezi Steinberg when he was in the lab. And then we asked, they have terrible seizures especially when these mice become eight to nine months old, the disease had been around for a while. And this is right, you know, they typically, these mice die by one year of age. So they're having seizures all day long. And we asked if we were to tape them and find they have seizures, but treat them with ASO, would the EEG normalize, would the seizures stop? And the answer was yes. So this was encouraging because here we started the treatment much later in life and we still got a benefit, eight to nine months of age. And finally, I told you that the dose of this protein is important and the humans have two identical dose, uh, genes that are duplicated. So we wanted to see if you can titrate the ASO. It's sort of like a blood pressure medication. If you give too much of a blood low, uh, pressure lowering drug, the individual will faint because you lower their blood pressure too much or somebody with diabetes, if you give too much insulin, it's dangerous because their glucose will go down. So we created mice that had two human copies of the gene uh, duplicated and we were able to show that we can actually titrate the drug so that we can bring it back to the right level rather than all the way down to give them red syndrome. And I'll summarize here something we learned using these mice is that when we treat the animals that have these humanized genes, the first thing that changes is the RNA of MECP2 because that's what the ASO does. It binds the RNA and lowers it. And the next thing that changes is the protein. And then what changes are all the genes that are changed because MECP2 levels are altered. They begin to normalize. And what was interesting is the clinical or behavioral rescue lag behind by several weeks. So you're changing the RNA at two weeks and the protein two to three weeks, but you're really not changing the behavior till in the mice at least nine to 12 weeks after that. So this told us that it does take time. There's a lag time between when you co co correct the genetic defect and the time that you see behavior defect. And in three months in the life of a mouse, maybe much longer in a human. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. So it's something to keep in mind because it tells us that the plasticity, it takes time to correct that uh, at least. But this, this also gives us opportunity to monitor the response and to look at markers that tell us we normalize the protein to the right level. So this is also great. So uh, just to summarize, then I, I shared with you how both loss of functions and duplications of this gene cause neurological disorders and milder mutations typically cause neuropsychiatric phenotypes. Shared with you that the antisense oligos can help us normalize the level of this protein. Maybe that can work for some of the dominant negative mutations. And then uh, pre-symptomatic training really changed the course of the disease in the rat-mouse model and uh, changed the, 
the properties of the neurons, and this is something we might want to consider in the future. Now, what we've learned from that, how is that helpful to think about and what questions we should think about for DDX3X? I think the phenotype of DDX3X, the whole phenotypic spectrum is not known yet. I think we only have a few hundred cases, but this is gonna be one of the more common causes, if you will, of developmental and intellectual disability. And it appears to be dose sensitive. So I think in the next few years, we're gonna learn a lot more and those phenotypes will expand and that's really important. Um, and it'll be wonderful if we can find modifier genes to really learn about how can we change the course of this disease. Uh, it may be worthwhile identifying the regulatory elements for the DX3X. One thing I did not share with you is in addition to learning that maybe mutations in these can also cause disease, we can use those as target to change the level of the gene. So these could become opportunities to upregulate the gene in the case of DDX3X. Also, perhaps network stimulation might work for certain phenotypes. Now that you have a great animal model, it's something to think about and explore. And of course, what's really important is pre-symptomatic training. I also, reading the stories you have on the foundation website, I realize many of the families have really struggled for years to know the diagnosis. It wasn't always uh, quick and easy at the beginning. And they were, the earlier the diagnosis, the better. And maybe this very early intense training could be helpful in some features of the disease. So with that, I want to first thank all the Red Syndrome and Duplication families who really trusted us and worked with us to find the genes and to help with uh, interventional studies. And uh, our funders, uh, shown here, NIH and HHMI and the RSRT Fund with the 401 Project from the families, uh, Henry Engel Fund and the Keck Foundation and the wonderful people who contributed to this work. Ruth, he found the gene, he did all the, I didn't mention his name, but he's the one who done the heavy training, early training studies. And then uh, I mentioned uh, the others uh, as we went along and our collaborators who've helped us with computational data in the physiology and Ionis Pharmaceuticals with the therapeutic intervention in the preclinical model. I will stop sharing so that we can answer questions. Uh, Joe, you're muted. Buddha, probably in another six months, I'll learn how to use Zoom. I don't have, I have not yet had enough practice apparently, but thank you for a great talk. Um, and really thank you for outlining what I, what I, what I said could be a roadmap for DDX3X. Um, and I think also for, for really kind of demonstrating the paradigm of going from the clinic to the lab and then ultimately back to the clinic, what we sometimes call from the bedside to the bench, back to the bedside. Um, and I think you've answered a lot of the questions, but maybe we can uh, spend a few minutes delving into them. Uh, some of the questions, uh, you know, we're going to have a larger uh, Q&A later, which I know you won't be able to attend because of your schedule. But, you know, one of the questions that the questions that we, I think we often hear, and I know you heard them too, is uh, one of them in the chat is, um, will there be a future medicine that might change or correct DDX gene to, uh, and what's the estimated timeline? And you've touched upon some of that with MECP2, the antisense and so on, but um, um, I, obviously it's more complicated than just the one path, but what I'm, I'm hoping you, you won't mind taking a, sure. a crack at that one. So um, I'll, I'll answer the, that one. I'll just give a roadmap a little bit. So the DTX3 axis, the first study was done in the mouse model. Uh, the, sorry, the ASO for MIC-P2 duplication was first published in 2015, when we showed you can reverse the symptoms. But then we had to go make a humanized model so that the drug can hit the humanized gene. So that was just published in 2020, end of 2020, 2021. It, it gives you an idea. It took eight years. Maybe you can shrink that by just a little bit, 
but it does really take time. And now in preparation to move in the clinic, we're doing the clinical readiness studies. And those are a couple of year studies before eventually hopefully moving into actual clinical trial. So eight to 10 years easily before we get into a clinical trial, it does take time. It's challenging because you want to really think of everything. You want to really make sure there is a benefit. You want to really monitor to prevent toxicity. Most of these things are dose sensitive. So it's going to really take some time to get to that step. Now, moving to DDX3X, it's not going to be treated by an ASO unless, unless someone can find a way to skip an exon and keep the function of the protein by mutation. So that's going to be a little bit challenging. One possibility in the near future is to really understand a little bit what this protein does and see are there other protein who can substitute for its function. And would regulating these other proteins, upregulating them, make up for the loss of this gene, partial loss. The other possibility this in, in the girls perhaps if we can somehow enhance the level of this gene, either by targeting some negative regulator with an ASO, so you can use an ASO strategy there, as long as the protein is somewhat functioning, that might help. So there are gonna be a lot of new opportunities, I think, by finding the regulators either at the RNA level or the protein levels that may help, or finding what we would call uh, something that can substitute for its function. And for that, I think now that you have an animal model, which actually lack the gene in half of the cells, you can actually do some genetic screens and find if there's something that can make up for that. That's, these are some approaches that I can think about. And uh, eventually, I also think as the field of gene therapy advances, really the ideal thing for this gene and for Rett syndrome is to edit the mutation, to correct the mutation. And while maybe a few years ago, we would have thought this is going to be in the realm of decades away from us, now we realize it's much faster because the new editing enzyme, the editases, that can actually correct the defect without necessarily the risk of inactivating other genes or causing deletions in the gene. But still, we don't know if they hit other sequences and cause editing where they don't want them to do that. But at least the technology is progressing and it's really exciting time that these new things could help. Yes, definitely. And then, so, so that's kind of gene targeted therapy, but you've also shown a lot of things that could work, you know, other interventions, DBS Correct. and uh, behavioral interventions. And so, you know, those might be deployed more rapidly. What's your, what do you say, what's your sense of the timeline from some of those discoveries that you've made in terms of whether they'd go in uh, in Rett syndrome starting with that? Right. I think for Rett syndrome, we are, we are looking at the motor phenotype because we thought if you're gonna, if you're gonna contemplate a, an intervention that involved the brain stimulation, which is an invasive approach, safe, but invasive, because safe, because it's used in children for other neurological problems. Um, you might as well maximize that. We don't want to go straight with a learning and memory because that's harder. As you can imagine, a 10 year old girl who may have not learned language, that's going to be much harder in a, a clinical trial. But a motor phenotype, if you can see improvement in the gait, if you can see better planning, motor planning, which red girls struggle with, would be better. So we're now working to see if deep brain stimulation improves motor function, and we're seeing benefit of that. So I'm hoping that that will be in the shorter term, one approach we'll use. And frankly, immediately, I would say that if we can make the diagnosis of red earlier and earlier, definitely true early repetitive intervention, physical therapy as we do it today is a little bit different. The child will go and will have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you know, some motor, uh, some other uh, activities, some balance and so on. Perhaps maybe these brains that are lacking in those genes require a focus on one task and to do that at a particular interval repeatedly. And if you've perhaps focused two days a week on a particular task in the morning, 
few hours later on another test, rather than doing things within an hour simultaneously and very little, that might be helpful. I don't know, but that's what we saw at least in the mice. So I think there are things we can do right away today with intensive training. I guess one message I would say to the parents, everything you're doing does make a difference, although you may not feel it is this way. I have a niece who have severe disability, and I remember her mother intuitively, my sister-in-law intuitively, and that was 35 years ago, uh, she just intensely did things with her. And she actually, she has uh, you know, a mutation in an R2F, which we discovered 35 years later, but at least she does really, it made a difference. She, she functions quite well as an adult and she's the oldest patient diagnosed with this gene. So these things that you're doing do really make a difference. Don't underestimate the power of teaching your child as much as you can in these various areas, whether it's physical therapy, whether how you talk to them or what, how you could learn teach them to communicate. All the things you're doing really make a difference. Thank you. So maybe one more question um, that you, one of the questions uh, from the audience is about uh, families that have twins with the same mutation and different phenotypes. And I know that there are current mutations in Rett syndrome as well, uh, as well as twins. So maybe how do you understand the same mutation either within a family or across families having different behavioral manifestations. Right. So in, in red, the reason the twins have different phenotypes is because of X inactivation. Because what happens is one of the twins will end up with fewer more Xs that have the mutant allele, and the other one has the majority of the Xs with the healthy allele being expressed. Now, although DDX3X escapes X inactivation, and I want to ask you that question, Joe, I, from reading everything about it and from looking into all the data, there is definitely some effect of whether you have skewing of X inactivation or not. So I don't know really, my suspicion that is a factor. That would be my first suspicion as a factor. Those always could be epigenetic changes, which means you don't change the base. All the DNAs are similar, but modification of the basis of the DNA could change. So I'm curious, Joe, I'm dying to ask you, do you think X inactivation plays a role in this disorder? So, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not that smart, but I do know some of our colleagues um, who are looking at this very carefully in the UK actually think that, X, that it does not completely escape X inactivation and that, um, and that there might be differences in phenotypes as a function of skewing. So that, that's, I think that's something that's just now, I think, emerging as a possibility. And I think, you know, if somebody does have, and, and I think people, you know, as people have twins that they, we're happy to kind of bring them in and, and see what we can learn in that context. But I think you're right, Huda, it, it seems to be imperfect uh, escape. Correct. Yeah, I think so. And I think the clinical data where you see the boys from asymptomatic females who are carriers, but really they do have skew, some of them have skewing and you know all of these data together. But, but I think the fact that it is partial, if you will, and not complete, that really gives you a great opportunity that upregulating the RNA and there are going to be so many ways you can do that. Regulatory elements would be one way to do it. Uh, micro RNA target sites would be another way. To, that might bring like an ASO mediated therapy faster than we think. So that's to me is a reason to be optimistic that it's a combination that, you know, there is some that escape X inactivation, but there's also some, some pattern of inactivation going on. Well, um, well I'm, we can go on and on and take up the rest of your, your afternoon and evening if you'd like. <laughs> thank you so much. I will let you move on with the program. I just want to thank all of you for listening and uh, hopefully one day I'll meet you in person. Thank you. And I really thank you so much for making the time. I, I did I did kind of uh, sabotage Shuda and ask her to participate um, without giving her a lot of opportunity to say no. And she was gracious enough to not only, not only say yes, but to accommodate uh, our schedule and make herself available and move things around so she could uh, join this call. And I know that, um, you know, she did it because thank she's you. very dedicated to the family. So thank, thank you, Huda. You.
Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Bye bye. Well, thank after that great talk. It's great. It's really a pleasure to introduce um, Rebecca Pollock. Rebecca is a, a postdoc. Uh, she comes to us from um, one of the top neurogenetics laboratories at Emory University. And she's come to Mount Sinai and she's been working on uh, this gene DDX3X. And she's um, been working on it, looking at from the point of view of in vitro studies or studies in petri dishes using human uh, cells that are then reprogrammed into nerve cells. And she does this under the supervision of Nan Yang, who I introduced in a slide earlier, uh, as well as uh, I, I, I somewhat under my, my supervision as well on, on a good day. So Becky, thank you for presenting. And I know this is um, more of a early stage presentation, but I think uh, you know the, the, the possibilities with the stem cells is amazing. And I would have mentioned some of the examples and I really appreciate you, you kind of laying out the promise and potential pitfall. I don't remember what the P's are, but take it away. Thank you so much, Joe, uh, for that introduction. I'm really excited to uh, share this information with all of you. So let me just pull these up really quickly. Um, so, okay, so hopefully everyone can see the slides now. Um, so like Joe said, I'm gonna be talking to you guys a little bit about uh, the process and promise are the two Ps that I chose um, of stem cell research. And so I wanted to start out by just talking a bit about what stem cells are for maybe some of the folks in the audience who are um, a little less familiar with these terms. Um, Stem cells are a specific type of cell in the body that have this unique ability to self-renew. And so what that means is that the stem cell can keep making more stem cells um, until it's called upon to differentiate into a more mature cell type. And we can divide stem cells into two sort of broad classes, um, one of which is adult stem cells and the other is pluripotent stem cells. And an example of an adult stem cell is um, a blood stem cell, like I'm showing in this diagram right here at the top. Um, adult stem cells are able to make specialized cell types within a specific organ or tissue in the body. So for the example of the blood stem cells that I'm showing here, this stem cell at the top can turn into any type of blood cell that's in your body. Um, and this process is constantly happening, which is why, for example, when you go to the doctor and have blood work done, um, your doctor can look at the proportions of the different types of blood cells that you have, red blood cells, white blood cells, et cetera, um, to make sure basically that these blood stem cells are, are doing their job properly in your body and making sure everything is, is working the way it's supposed to. So in contrast to these adult stem cells, um, pluripotent stem cells are actually able to make every different cell type uh, in the human body. So here's an example of a pluripotent stem cell. So we see at the top row, this example of self-renewal where the stem cell, the pluripotent stem cell is making more uh, pluripotent stem cells, or it could differentiate into any mature cell type in the body. So we have examples here, a muscle cell, a blood cell, a nerve cell, um, and so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing specifically on these pluripotent stem cells. So there's two different kinds of pluripotent stem cells. Um, the first is uh, what we're calling natural stem cells. So these are stem cells that are present um, in everyone um, at very early stages of development. And they're the cells that are responsible for making a person, um, making all of the cells in the human body. Induced pluripotent stem cells, on the other hand, um, which I'm going to abbreviate as iPSCs, just for brevity, um, are made in the lab from mature cells. And this technique was first uh, described by a pair of scientists named Takahashi and Yamanaka back in 2006. And they won the Nobel Prize for this discovery actually in 2012. So I'm bringing this diagram back that we just looked at. Um, where we have this pluripotent stem cell that can either make more stem cells or make mature cells. And the amazing thing that Takahashi and Yamanaka accomplished in their work back in 2006 is that they figured out how to make this process, instead of going from the stem cell to the mature cells, to go backwards, where you can take a mature cell and turn it back into a stem cell. Um, where we're basically turning back the clock and making these mature cells now behave like natural stem cells in the lab. 
So now that we know a little bit about what iPSCs are, um, let's take a look at how we actually make these cells in the lab. So the first step in this is to create mature cells, which are usually either blood or skin cells um, from a participant in a scientific study. So in our DDX3X syndrome studies at the Seaver Center, for example, um, you've heard a little bit about how we collect blood samples from some of our participants, and we can use those blood cells to make iPSCs. So once the blood cells are collected, they're treated with either a genetic or chemical, uh, what we're calling reprogramming factors. Um, and these are mo the molecules that, like I said, turn back the clock in the mature cells to make them act like these natural stem cells. So then once we've treated the cells with the reprogramming factors, we can let the cells grow for several weeks, and then we're able to redifferentiate them into whatever mature cell type that we're interested in. And so in the case of DDX3X syndrome, um, and like what Dr. Zogby was just talking about with some of the Rett syndrome studies, because we're really interested in the brain, we can turn our iPSCs into nerve cells um, in the lab and do experiments on them. We're really excited about this ability to make iPSCs from blood samples because um, iPSCs, since they've been described, have become an incredibly valuable research tool. Uh, one of the key benefits of iPSCs is that they can help us to address some of the limitations of animal models um, of different disorders. So you heard about some of the really amazing work um, that Sylvia and her lab have been doing with the mouse model. And we can learn a lot from these um, rodent models, but one of the things that, that might seem obvious to all of you um, is that mouse and rat brains are not always directly comparable to human brains. Um, so when we're interested in studying something like DDX3X syndrome that has a lot of impacts on the brain, um, this is an important factor that we want to consider when we're designing our studies. Another factor is that because iPSCs are created from samples that are directly from our human research participants, um, we're able to use them to understand a little bit more about the changes that a disorder might be causing in a human cells, um, instead of having to try to estimate or infer um, what might be happening in the human based on what we see in our mice. Another really valuable feature um, of iPSCs, something we've already talked about, um, which is their ability to be differentiated into whatever cell type um, a given researcher is interested in. And so this is useful when we're thinking about modeling the changes that a disorder is causing in a specific type of cells. And if we look at this diagram here at the sort of bottom half, it's also really useful when we're thinking about testing or discovering new possible medicines or treatments um, for a specific disorder. And that's because we can grow a lot of iPSCs at once, which means then we're able to generate a lot of these mature cell types that we're interested in, um, which we can then use to test many different therapeutics at the same time. And this can really help us um, speed up the process of sort of prioritizing some of these potential um, medicines or treatments for further testing in our animal models and down the road in um, clinical trials. So I wanted to show you a little bit about what iPSCs look like. Um, so these two pictures are actually pictures of cells, um, iPSCs that were made from blood samples um, from one of our ddx rex syndrome study participants and her mom. Um, so when we look at these sort of clumps, these are islands of cells. So the iPSCs themselves are actually really, really tiny. Um, so each of these big islands that you see, that hopefully you can see my mouse, I'm circling one here, um, is actually made up of a lot of iPSCs that are packed really tightly together. Um, and what happens is these islands of cells get bigger and bigger until they touch one another, which you can see is happening almost right here. And they'll merge together to form larger islands. And eventually the cells will cover uh, the majority of the dish that they're growing in. So when we're growing iPSCs, we want to wait until we have a lot of them in the dish until they're covering a lot of the dish. Um, before we can start differentiating them into our um, nerve cells or other mature cells that we're interested in. So this is an example on um, just some pictures of nerve cells that were made from iPSCs. Um, these samples are not from, from people with DDX3X syndrome, 
Um, but I thought these were really nice pictures to show you sort of what these nerve cells look like um, in the petri dishes that Joe was talking about that we have in the lab. Um, so what you can see is the body of the cells are kind of in the middle and they're sort of, they have this bit of halo, shiny halo around them, which makes it a bit easier probably for you to see. Um, and then they have these sort of long strings that look, that look like strings coming out of those shiny middle bits in the cells. Um, and these long bits that stick out in the middle of the cells are how the nerve cells actually can communicate with one another um, using processes just like they do uh, in your actual brain um, to send signals and messages uh, between the different cells. So this, I'm hoping the video works. Oh, here it goes. Um, this is actually a really cool example of some heart cells that were made for iPSCs. So this is an example of how the cells that we make in the lab can behave similarly to the cells in your actual body. Um, so we can see these heart cells are sort of rhythmically beating just like we would expect um, in a normal heart. Um, even though these cells aren't pumping blood and they're not shaped like a heart, um, they're still doing this sort of basic biological process. So this highlights one of the ways that um, we can use iPSCs to replicate some of these natural processes in the human body. There we go. Um, another interesting and useful thing that we can do with iPSCs and something that has become more um, commonly talked about sort of in um, articles and news articles about, about scientific achievements is making these 3D structures that are called organoids, which might be a, a term that some of you are familiar with, or, um, or mini brains, which some people call them in, in news stories, um, are these sort of brain organoids. Um, the mini brain name is, is maybe a bit misleading because um, if you look at these, this picture here, the, these don't really look like tiny brains exactly. Um, they're, they're more like balls of cells. Um, but what's really fascinating is that the structure um, of these balls is very similar to the early stages of brain development, um, which you can see in these images here. We have different layers of nerve cells forming within these organoids that uh, mimics um, very early um, embryonic brain development. And so because we're mimicking those very early developmental stages, um, these organoid models are becoming a very popular way to study genetic conditions like dbx x syndrome that affect the brain. Um, because we can grow these organoids for much longer um, and they're much more complex than the two-dimensional cultures of nerve cells that I showed you before. So I wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, Rett syndrome just briefly, even though I know Dr. Zogby just gave everyone a really wonderful um, sort of story of, of Rett syndrome. Um, just because our research in DDX through X syndrome is still in its early stages. Um, so back in 1999 is when Dr. Zogby and her team identified the MECP2 gene that she was talking about that is um, responsible for causing Rett syndrome. Um, and then two years later, the first mouse models of Rett syndrome were developed. Um, but it actually wasn't until 2009 that iPSCs were first developed from Rett syndrome patients. Um, once the iPSC models were available, people started making the, the two-dimensional nerve cell cultures um, shortly after. And then again, it took several years. So within the past couple of years now, um, different research groups have published studies of organoids that were created from iPSCs from Rett syndrome patients. So just to kind of give you an idea that, that this type of research does take a long time, um, but we, we have accelerated this a bit. You know, we've known about DDX3X. We, we have started making um, iPSCs in our lab. So uh, we're hopeful that you know, within, within the next several years, we'll, we'll be able to keep pushing this timeline forward. Um, so now I wanna talk about what this, what this means specifically for us right now um, in the context of DDX3X syndrome. 
So like I said, uh, we're still very early in the research process for DDX3X syndrome, um, but you've already heard about some incredible things um, from the other speakers today. So the mouse model that um, Sylvia's lab has developed, which has been so useful in starting to learn and understand the changes that um, a reduced amount of DDX3X protein can cause. Uh, Dorothy and Tess talked about the clinical research at the Seaver Center. Um, and some of the participants in that clinical research study have um, generously donated blood for as a part of their visit. Um, and so our plan is to reprogram some of these blood samples into iPSCs. And then we can use those iPSCs to make nerve cells to study in the lab. And so we'll be able to use this techniques to understand how mutations in DDX3X change the function of nerve cells and might be leading to some of these um, developmental differences and challenges that some of the kids with ddx rex syndrome experience. So I've said that we can make nerve cells from iPSCs, but I haven't really talked about how these, these cells actually work. Um, so like I sort of briefly mentioned before, the nerve cells that we can make from our iPSCs are able to communicate with each other, um, just like nerve cells in the brain do. And so to communicate, nerve cells actually use electrical signals that are transmitted through uh, connection points between the different nerve cells. And so these connection points are called synapses, and we can highlight these synapses with different dyes and see them with a microscope. Um, so these pictures that I'm showing at the bottom are from nerve cells that were made from iPSCs, and the synapses are highlighted in red. So as we go from left to right, we're sort of zooming in um, on one specific nerve cell. And in the far right image, you can see these red dots. So that is actually where two different neurons or nerve cells are connecting to one another. And that's the point where they can communicate with one another. So not only can we see these synapses or connections using dyes, but we can actually measure the nerve cells communicating with one another by measuring the electrical signals that they're sending, which I think of sort of like as eavesdropping on our cells a little bit. So there's two different methods that we can use to measure the electrical signals that our nerve cells are sending. Um, the first method that we use is called a multi-electrode array, which is a special type of Petri dish shown here that has chips, like computer chips, with tiny electrodes embedded in the bottom of each well, which you can see these little gold dots at the bottom of each well here. Now we can put the neurons on top of these chips, which is shown here. So each of these black dots is an electrode, and then we see the white outline around the neurons in this picture. Um, once the neurons are on top of those electrodes, we can measure the electrical signals that they're sending to each other. Um, so this technique is really useful when we want to measure a lot of different nerve cells at once. Um, and it can be also used to test if different treatments are changing the way that nerve cells are communicating with each other, um, which is one of the ways we might be able to identify new medicines that could help correct some of the changes that might be present in nerve cells. Um, the one downside to this technique is that we can't use it to listen to one nerve cell at a time to figure out what individual cells are doing. Um, we're actually listening to what's called the network activity of the nerve cells. And so a good way to imagine this is that um, this technique is kind of like being in a crowded room where a lot of people are talking. Um, so you can tell if people are talking really loudly or if people are talking really quietly. Um, and you can tell if people are all talking sort of at once in different conversations. So there's kind of just a buzz of noise or if people are mostly saying the same thing at the same time, like if people were singing in a choir. Um, but you can't actually identify what a specific person or cell in this case is saying. So to achieve that aspect, um, we need to use a different technique. And that technique is called patch clamping. Um, so here, instead of putting the cells on top of the electrodes, we actually insert electrodes directly into the cell or cells that we're interested in 
like you can see here. So we can see here there's a neuron, the cell body here. And then this pointy thing is an electrode that gets stuck into the cell. And that allows us to measure that cell's communications very precisely. And what's really interesting is we can also talk back to the cell um, by sending it electrical signals and measuring what that cell does in response. So in contrast to being in a crowded room, this technique is more like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the nerve cell, um, which does take a lot longer than the multi-electrode array that I showed you before, but it gives us really detailed information about how the nerve cells are functioning. So now this is some example data that we can get from the multi-electrode array where we're listening to all of our cells at the same time. Um, so this is a picture of some nerve cells communicating. Um, and these cells were made as part of a different Siever Center project, but I'm also going to use this technique to look at the DDX3X nerve cells. So the waves here you can see show that the nerves are sending the electrical signals and communicating with one another. And we can see that different areas of the plate have different amounts of activity. So you can see, for example, this wave here is pretty big, whereas this wave here is a bit smaller. We can also see in these dots at the bottom where the cells are communicating all at once, like that singing that I um, was talking about before in these sort of red vertical uh, columns versus when there's just kind of random conversations going on um, in the dish, which are where we just have these white dots. So as the nerve cells get older and get more mature, these red bars where all the cells are talking at once get more, um, much more common and the random bits of conversation um, become less common. So this is another way that we can watch the nerve cells communicating with each other. Um, so these flashes of light that you see here on this plate are actually showing exactly where the nerve cells are sending electrical signals. So the blue, like here, here is for the weaker signals and the red is for stronger signals. As the nerve cells get more mature, um, they start having stronger and more frequent flashes of communication until eventually we're able to see the entire plate lighting up when we're measuring the cells. So here's an example of some nerve cells that are actually made from iPSCs from a person with DDX3X syndrome that participated in our study. So these are the iPSCs from this individual where the cells are, are nice and tightly packed into their islands like I showed you before. And here we can see some nerve cells with their shiny bodies and their long projections that they can use to communicate with one another. So to wrap up, I just wanted to tell you about some of my goals for the project. Um, so in the short term, I'm planning to use these iPSC generated nerve cells that I've been talking about to understand how different mutations in DDX3X affect the nerve cell function. I'm also going to do experiments to learn about how the DDX3X protein functions in human cells without mutations in DDX3X because we don't have good data on that yet. And like Dr. Zogby was just talking about, um, that's going to be a really critical step in understanding um, how we might be able to manipulate DDX3X uh, in a therapeutic setting. And then I'll use those cells to compare to the iPSCs with mutations in DDX3X to learn how those mutations are changing the function of the protein. So in the long term, we're going to reprogram more blood samples from our DDX3X study participants and their families so that we can keep learning about how different mutations might change how nerve cells work or function in a different way. Um, we're also hoping to use the iPSC-derived nerve cells to screen for new medicines that might be effective in treating different symptoms of DDX3X syndrome. Uh, and the last thing is um, hopefully we'll eventually be able to create some 3D organoids so that we can look at the longer term effects of mutations in DDX3X on nerve cell development. So just to wrap up, um, I wanna thank Dr. Buxbaum for uh, sort of, <laughs> and, um, Dr. De Rubais for creating this project and sort of giving me the opportunity to study DDX direct syndrome in the first place, um, as well as Dr. Yang, who has been um, a really wonderful mentor and support while I've been uh, learning about IPSCs during my time here at Mount Sinai in the Seaver Center. Um, I wanna thank the Seaver Center team, uh, the Seaver Foundation for um, supporting my work. And then of course, for, for all of you in the audience, our DDX direct syndrome families who, um, make this work possible. And I'd be happy to, uh, to take any questions now.
Well, thank you, uh, Becky, for a great talk. Um, I know there's going to be a larger discussion later on, hopefully, but um, you know, what, what, coming back to the question about therapeutics, be they you know gene therapies or other kinds of therapies. So how, how would you use these cells? I mean, you kind of shown it, but maybe you could walk us through how you could use these cells to either identify something that might be beneficial or screen some or test something that might that you think might be beneficial. Sure. So um, I think that the the easiest way to picture this is um, if we have maybe a handful of different medicines that that we think might be helpful. Um, we can make a whole bunch of, of nerve cells um, in different dishes and we can treat each of those dishes with a different um, medicine. And we can then compare those different treatments with the original untreated cells to see um, if any changes happen in the cells, whether that's in the um, communication between the nerve cells, or if it's in um, gene expression or other sort of molecular changes that could take place. Um, I think that's sort of a broad way to think about it. So, so that's on the that's more in the context of if you had some a few a few lead compounds, how you might be able to test them in detail. Sure. Yeah. I, I think uh, yeah. Uh, Anna Kostic is um, on, attending as well. And I think, uh, you know, maybe we can take a step back and say, how could you screen like many compounds? Let's say you weren't quite sure which one might work. Is there a way to, um, you know, is there a way to take what, take some of the changes you might see in the, in the, in, in vitro and use those as a um, platform? And I'm also inviting Anna to join if she wants to yes. jump in. Wonderful. Yeah, I am. I am by no means an expert in um, medicine, sort of testing and development. So, if Anna would like to step in and lend some of her expertise, that would be uh, wonderful. I don't yeah. want to speculate. And I'm going to put her on the spot. She has a, a, a couple of young kids at home, and maybe yes. now, now's not the best time. But um, I, you know, the the word that we often hear is scalable, scalability, right? If you right. want to. And a petri dish can be this big, or you can actually make petri dishes that have each well is almost microscopic, right? Yes, exactly. And, um, yeah, and so if you you know with these with these robots, lab robots that actually can put out hundreds of compounds on a plate at the same time, if each if the plate has many many thousands of tiny wells where the cell where your nerve cells are in there, then you can take what they call compound libraries and screen them all in kind of an agnostic way, right? Without necessarily, um, there's some question whether that's the best way for rare disorders, but certainly um, it is um, it, it is one way and it's one way that, you know, obviously the pharmaceutical companies have used to great effect in drug discovery and development. So Anna has just said that she's having some trouble and she can't unmute her, she can't unmute right now. Um, oh, and so I'm, okay. I'm going to I'm going to channel her to the best of my ability, but I think I think we I know that she has been talking to many companies, and I think that you know if we come up with a a change in vitro something that you see differently with the stem cells um, that can be scaled that can be done in such a way that can be done quickly in, in, in little tiny petri dishes then. Um, we strongly believe that some of our colleagues in industry um, would be very interested in screening the compounds because they already have compounds that they've made, you know, what they call compound libraries. Some companies have a million compounds that they've developed and they'd like nothing better than to try and see if there's a new way to, to make use of those to help uh, other, you know, help humankind, so to speak. So, um, Becky, I'm going to... Um, take a step back, kind of make some closing statements and then start the open conversations. And the reason I'm doing that is because um, we do have European uh, participants and I know that some of them um, are probably gonna um, try and get to bed. 
So thank you for a great talk. And I really appreciate that you presented things that are still kind of in the early stages. I think that's uh, exciting. And, um, and, and, and I know it's, you know, it's not always easy to present things when they're just in the early stages. Um, but I think this is where the field is going to go. And I'm, I'm really glad that you're able to kind of give us a, you know, uh, a, a survey of what's coming. Um, and so, and, so, and everybody will stay on and I'm just going to, um, I'm going to answer some questions that, uh, that are easy for, that I can answer if I can. But wait a minute, I got the wrong slides already. And only just two, two minutes since I've put them, since I modified them, I've. Uh, but I did want to say while I'm looking for slides, um, that I want to thank all everybody who atten attended and I want to thank not only um, the families who attended, but I also want to point out that we've had some um, attendees who are experts from all over the world. Um, including David Skews from the UK and Cheska Kleefstra from uh, Neymichen and uh, Audrey Thurm from uh, NIH Intramural uh, and many other people who um, I quickly took to look at the names. And so we have, um, you know, expert scientists, expert clinicians uh, joining. And we also have people who are really committed to working together on the research side and the clinical research side to, um, you know, do, do the best we can for the syndrome. And I want to thank those individuals uh, specifically for joining, because as I said, some of them, uh, including the ones in, uh, that I mentioned, are actually in Europe and uh, agreed to kind of make it a um, make it a late night just so they could participate. Now I found the slides I was going to show, and here they are. So um, just. Uh, Again, I want to thank you all for attending, families, uh, trainees, experts, um, people interested in the syndrome, people who want to get more involved in any, any way. And I'm going to um, give you some contact information. First, there was a question early on about are we going to share the slides? And um, the answer is that um, the event has been recorded and it takes a little bit of editing. Um, so we can't say exactly when, but certainly within uh, this month, we expect you know, the post, the, the, the recorded event, it'll be on our website, zeroautismcenter.org. But also all the participants will get an email with the link. Um, so you don't need to write that down. And if you have any questions um, that you, that, um, about this event, please email Rachel Cohen, who's already been in communication with you. One of the questions we received is a couple of questions about how to participate. And uh, the best thing to do is to contact Tess Levy, who presented earlier, and her email address is tess.levy at mssm.edu, if you want to take a moment to um, write that down. And you can always contact Rachel, who's already been in touch with you, and ask for Tess's information, or for mine, or for anybody else's. And then um, we do have a, um, you know, people who, people are all, ask how they can get more involved not only in the research but also um, in the in the Cibra Center and there's an opportunity always to um, support some of the work we do and to target that support to DDX3X syndrome and Mount Sinai hosts a website for this called giving at mount sinai.org front slash Cibra. And we also have a board uh, of um, typically of family members uh, but other people as well that um, you know give us feedback about the direction of our research and um, you know, help us understand what are the priorities for families. And if you're interested in joining that board now or in the future, please reach out to Sarah Lynch, who uh, manages um, that aspect of the Seaver Center. Her name and email address and phone number are there as well. And of course, if you have trouble copying all those things down, you can always reach out to me or to Rachel. Um, there's my address there, and I'll put you in touch with anybody uh, in the Seaver Center that um, could directly answer your questions about the science we do, about the clinical work, about, the, um, about supporting the center, about participating in the center, and about uh, giving us feedback and telling us what we can do better. So I just wanted to get put, put, put this out there now before we opened up to more general uh, discussion, because as I said, I knew some people were um, 
looking longingly at uh, at um, you know having that last glass of wine and going to sleep. So uh, people um, want to turn on their videos and unmute. Um, we can we can um, deal with some of the open questions that are still haven't been addressed, and maybe also um, talk about some questions that we talked about before, and um, see if we want to talk about them in further detail. So one of the questions again is, uh, how do we contact you to participate? And so we hopefully have dealt with that. Uh, another question um, is about autoimmune disorders in um, DDX3X syndrome. So Tess, you want to take a first stab at that and we can talk more about how we understand it in a big picture? Yeah, um, I'm not sure, um, Dorothy might know more about specific diagnoses of autoimmune disorders, but I know for um, a handful of participants, we've seen recurrent infections, um, things like recurrent ear infections, recurrent UTIs, and um, upper respiratory tract infections. Um, Dorothy can probably speak more to how that could relate to a possible autoimmune condition, but I'm not sure um, specific diagnoses. So we could do some screening, um, picking a page out of the autoimmune specialist book of a subset of our folks uh, that came in uh, for the in-person visits. And we didn't find evidence of serious autoimmune difficulties. But what is true from what we've seen so far is that many, many kids in our um, cohort have a lot of recurrent common infections, right? Which is which is not any good either, right? Uh, a lot of recurrent colds, viruses, pneumonias, ear infections, and of course, all those things um, well, are difficult to, to deal with, and they can impede development in some ways in terms of being able to hear or speak or just being uncomfortable or in pain. And it, it also may be related to uh, the, the other, you know, hypotonia and hypertonia issues. If it's difficult to clear your throat, to cough effectively, et cetera, you're going to be more prone to having these kind of secondary or tertiary complications, which is also so important for us to appreciate and, and learn more about. One of the, one of the things that uh, um, some, of the, uh, some of the basic scientists in the Seaver Center are doing is they're actually taking um, blood cells from individuals with the syndrome and asking questions about whether the, the immune things that you see with blood cells might be different with the presence or absence of DDX3X gene. So here's one that maybe, um, Sylvia, we talked about a little bit about, but maybe you can talk a little bit more. Um, you know, somebody has identical twins with the same mutation, but um, the phenotypes are different. How do you, we talked a little bit about whether the exon activation uh, escape is complete, whether they're skewing. What are some of the other mechanisms that you, we should be considering there? Yeah, so I think uh, Dr. Zogby was also alluding to epigenetics, so changes that can occur, you know, on top of our genetic makeup. Um, um, as she was also alluding to, is not that uncommon for rare genetic conditions to have cases like this where twins with the very exact same mutation display, um, you know, divergent um, or not completely overlapping clinical phenotypes. Um, so going back to the to the X inactivation, um, it, it is certainly a, a, a topic that we need to investigate further because even if the DX Rex were to escape um, X inactivation completely, uh, it would it would still have variability in terms of the the specific copy that is being inactivated. So we know that escape genes are anyway not being completely express from the inactive copy of the X chromosome. So depending on where that mutant copy fall on the chromosome, it might lead to variability. So I think, you know, the, the X chromosome inactivation is certainly the first place to look at, um, but um, other epigenetic changes, um, naming, uh, you know, changes that are laid on top of the genetics and can control when where and how genes are expressed is um, an, another potential mechanism. Yeah. Thank you. So there's a question about uh, communication. I mean, Tess, uh, you showed some of the data on receptive versus exp expressive language. So the question is, are there speech, speech and language pathologists that are um, 
conducting or laying groundwork for studies that pertain to various intervention strategies to improve speech uh, or language in children with EDX or X syndrome. And um, I know that's a tough, a tough question to answer, but um, anybody feel like, anybody wanna say something about that? Dorothy, why don't you start? So I think this is obviously such an important area. Uh, being able to communicate with your child um, and have your child communicate with you is, is just so fundamental, right? To, to family life and, and knowing what's happening for your kid and when they need help or comfort or when they're happy. And so I, I know it's a big priority. I, I, I don't think that Paige is on, um, but certainly we have thought about how to um, look more at specific language assessments. Uh, and I do think there are other groups, um, but not ours who are working. I'm not sure, Joe, is um, something come up with LATA in terms of that? Or maybe I'm misremembering if they were doing something with language. Um, I don't, uh, so with DDX or X syndrome specifically, I don't, there's, there, I don't know of any research where people are looking at yes. the interventions and seeing, um, you know, better, uh, which one might work better or worse. I, I, I know that some families are going to their, uh, going to SLPs to, stand, to typical speech and language pathologists and getting interventions. Um, but whether somebody's actually actively studying it in the syndrome and seeing, you know, for example, what works better, what's not, that's a, that's a, that's a hard study to do with a disorder where we don't have a very big, um, we don't have a lot of people tested and known to be positive because you really need people to come back over and over again over a long period of time uh, to see if the intervention is working uh, better or worse. Um, and, and I just wanna, there's also a questionnaire about um, augmented uh, and alternative communication, uh, same thing. Um, and the answer is that we don't, I don't know of anybody who's doing that. I know that the Seber Center has developed some methodologies more broadly in, uh, in augment, collaborating with people on augmented communication devices. But again, to do it specifically in the syndrome, um, you need, ideally, you need a lot of people in one place or you need a network of people who are working uh, collectively. And I just don't think we're there yet. But one of the reasons I'm kind of dwelling on this, first of all, is it's it's a question from the from the audience, but also it's a question I think we get a lot, right? Um, are we focusing on speech and language? And um, you know, and I think the there were some surveys done uh, within the Family Foundation that said that this was a priority. Um, and so, you know, it, it it does beg the question. I think that maybe the question for us is more. Is this, is this an endpoint that we'd like to you know, target if we were thinking about clinical trials in the future? Um, so I'm gonna put Dorothy on the spot again. Anna, Anna apparently conveniently can't unmute, so she's not gonna jump in, but uh, that leaves it to you, Dorothy. Yeah, so certainly um, I do think that this was, this is, as I mentioned earlier, it's such an important area of development um, for quality of life putting it into our, I think, finding ways that we can put it into a protocol is kind of the tricky part, because as you point out, we have to have sufficient numbers and, and expertise to, to do that. But I think it's an area that definitely warrants more understanding. And I think, I don't know whether we can take any um, pages out of other people's books who've done this and other developmental disorders. I think it's, you know, it's something to think about too. I thought it was very interesting. And other disorders. Sorry, didn't mean to no, over you. I, th I found it very interesting that Huda Zogby was talking about using, you know, focusing on motor for the DPS studies. And I don't think it's because, well, in Rett syndrome, some of the motor issues are very severe and very impairing. And of course, there are. Um, autonomous motor issues in Rett syndrome, like respiratory rate and heart, which are probably not gonna be changed by the, the particular DPS stimulus. But I think, I think her point was that, you know, they're focusing on motor because it, it's somehow, a, you know, it's an obvious, it's easy to measure. It was implicit in what she was saying. And she compared it to, for example, looking at learning and memory which would be a hard thing to measure accurately in a clinical trial. Clinical trials often go on for a short period of time. And if, they, if something works, then of course, 
you you keep on using it for longer and you hope to see more benefits. But I think the reality is certainly when you think about it translationally, right? The mouse is probably not going to show speech, speech and language deficits, but it might show motor deficits. And that would be a reasonable target for a novel drug. And of course, the, the hope and expectation is if it works for something like motor, it could probably work for higher order, if you will, behavioral things. Sylvia, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would say that the motor component is probably, at least in the mouse, the one of the best readouts. Um, the fact that we also see changes with time and that it is a phenotype that can be modified by prior behavioral exposure also suggests that you know we actually have the tools to measure changes, uh, changes in the direction of you know an ameliorated motor function in the in the mouse model. So definitely based on what we see in the, um, in the mouse, I would say that motor, it, it would be very promising um, readout. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, and I think Dorothy said it very well, is we think that the speech and language is a very critical part of the, of the, of, of the phenotype and something that it's worth studying um, from, the, from the point of view of the more translational perspective, it's probably not the first thing to tackle with um, the kind of work we do. But of course, for a speech and language pathologist, this would be a, a great study. And again, if there was a network of individuals that wanted to work together and characterize the specific issues with speech and language and then see what interventions um, would make a difference, that would be fantastic. And I think that that goes to one of the slides that Tess was showing um, from the clinical group that is there, there is a ongoing discussion with other sites to try and figure out common phenotypic measures, um, and maybe Dorothy, you can talk a little bit about that and what, what you know, what, what would that look like, and and what's the importance of it? So obviously, developing a network would allow several things, right? We'd have more people working on DDX3X syndrome, which would be fantastic, um, and if we are able to have families and. Is that me? No. Uh, sorry. Uh, have families um, be able to access uh, specialist sites more easily rather than them being that right now they're fairly scattered, right? But if we had a couple across the United States and other areas around the world, um, that would be wonderful. And it also would lay the groundwork for being able to do clinical trials and interventions if everyone knew and did the same type of assessments uh, and the longitudinal assessments over time. And we were all reliably able to exchange data would really increase our capacity uh, to develop studies that were powerful enough to hopefully give us good answers to whether this intervention or this treatment was effective or not. Sorry about the ringing in the background. Yes, and so I think, you know, I mentioned some of the names of people who were attending. I don't know if you all got a chance to survey them. I, I didn't have anything to do, but look at all the attendees. And some of those individuals, uh, I do want to, we are going to meet with them, I think, right? Or you're going to meet with them to talk about how to make a network of expert sites that can kind of think about what are the top things to measure and how to measure them in a way that every site measures them at the same time. So, and maybe a related question um, from one of our attendees is what is being done to educate medical professionals about this syndrome? Um, and this is something we're, we've heard before, right? Many pediatricians and specialists, I may even go, to, go so far as to say most pediatricians and specialists have not heard of it. So how do we, how do we take what we learned in the, um, you know, in the research space, if you will, and make it available to medical professionals? Tess, you, want, you mentioned a little bit about that. You wanna go a little further with that? Um, so the current uh, manuscript or paper that we're working on now is hoping to answer that question. Um, so we're looking to publish practice parameters or medical recommendations, which would be published guidelines of the different features associated with ddx syndrome and then what clinical evaluations we recommend. Um, so things like if um, because of the probability of precocious puberty, should they have this sort of workup or because of the um, probability of gait disturbance, they should have a neurological workup. Um, and so hopefully that will help streamline the um, process for people. I've definitely heard from many parents that have children with rare diseases that they end up educating every single doctor that they see about DDX3X syndrome. 
Um, so hopefully this should also help parents of just printing out one article and saying this is everything that my child needs. Um, and hopefully also will help all of the, the general doctors and all the specialists read more about the overall picture instead of just treating one organ system at a time. And those kinds of doc, those kinds of uh, practice parameters, they, they're, they're, they're very dynamic, right? As we learn more, they can be updated. I also think it's worth noting that um, the paper that you were involved in and, and Dorothy was the, was the lead on or the senior author on, uh, is available online as a for anybody to access. It's an open access paper, and so um, even though it's somewhat technical, um, a specialist should should be able to read it and get a sense of it. But of course, having the actual practice parameters paper that kind of outlines different domains and you know should what you what you should look at is a um, is I think the next natural step. And that there too, we'd like to definitely work with other sites um, that have experience and kind of come up with a consensus on, given what we know today, what should the clinician um, you know, look for? So there's a question about regression um, and do we see regression? Um, well, the question is about, do we generally see regression in neurodevelopment disorders? And um, you know, what is regression? How does it compare to, how does regression compare to individuals who don't even acquire the skill in the first place? This is a really, I think a general question because I'm not sure, but do we think we're seeing regression? We'll talk about the mouse second, but what about in, in do we know and what would it take to show that there's actual regression in DDX3X syndrome? We don't have a clear understanding of that, but what, we, what would help us to understand that about it is to be able to do longitudinal assessments of individuals and of course, seeing them younger, particularly as you know, Huda was talking about, the younger the better, right? So you really can get a sense of what are the developmental um, points where you really need to focus and do assessments, and where you know where and where can you intervene if you can can you impede possible regression, which would be fantastic. But we don't have a good clear understanding about pretty dextric syndrome whether regression is common or not. Yeah. So Sylvia, you want to talk a little bit about the mouse and what you see in the old, old, older mice? Yeah, sure. So um, as I was saying during my talk, we have compared, especially for the motor component, um, adult mice at four months of age and aging mice at one year old. And we actually aim to also include two years old um, mice, which is, you know, the, the mice that we really, really could, could do in, um, in captivity. But then that happened during COVID. And so unfortunately we lost this court of animals uh, that we had kept for two years. So what we see when we compare um, four months and one year old is that the one year old do have a more pronounced, uh, more pronounced motor deficits. However, and, and this applies when the one year old have not done any training whatsoever in their life. They have been kept you know, in their home cages for one year without any uh, behavioral training. However, when we look at one year old that have had prior exposure to behavioral challenges, we do see that that motor decline is no longer there. So this also brings me back to that point that I was alluding to earlier when I was saying that the motor problems are probably a, a good um, readout for us because they also seem to be modifiable, right? So prior exposure alleviates this motor decline. Um, so we haven't looked at other phenotypes, uh, cognition or anxiety or um, social, but in, in, the, in the realm of motor function, we do see a decline unless there is some behavioral intervention, let's say, that happens when the, when the animals are adults. And just to make a comparison, when we are talking about aging mice, a one-year-old, we are talking about 50 years old. So we had kept the animals until two to try and look at roughly eight years old um, mice. Does that make sense? Yes, mice live a short time. Yeah. And age rapidly. But also talking about aging, just one point that I wanted to make during my talk, we also look at longevity of the uh, mutant female mice compared to um, typically developing females, and we do not see differences. So also our mutant females got to two years old 
as well as their, their sister. So we did not see a decrease in longevity. Um, I'm just typing a answer to a question that's probably best just typed. So um, one of the questions that uh, people are asking, you know, how do we collaborate with other sites um, and specifically UCSF, which is a wonderful site. Um, and maybe you can talk about, uh, uh, Dorothy, about the CZI initiative and that relationship. And another uh, site mentioned here is the bingo study, which maybe um, I can come back to that after you, we talk about uh, CZI. One second, I need to close the door to where I'm sitting. Okay, well, maybe I'll start with the bingo study. So uh, um, I have to admit that I did not know that the bingo study, which is a, it's a study um, looking at, um, it's an MRC study on cognition for known genetic disorders. And I did not realize until this moment, this is where these meetings are very helpful to us. I did not know that they're also looking at DDX3X syndrome. And so we'll certainly reach out to them. I did mention uh, David Skuse, who um, uh, as he, uh, I don't know if he wants me to share this, but uh, he said it was a fascinating evening for all of us in the UK. Uh, we're following up on our DDX3X subjects of which they have quite a few but he has to go cook supper now. Uh, and so David is at uh, UCL University College London, and I suspect he's involved with bingo, but I, we will definitely reach out um, to the MRC and to David and, and, and others, uh, make sure that uh, you know, we're all kind of working together. The, um, the challenge of the rare disorders is of course that they're rare. And so um, anybody who's serious about it has to collaborate pretty broadly um, to, make it, to make an impact. So, Dorothy, do you want to talk about the CZI initiative that uh, the, found, uh, the foundation, uh, maybe maybe many of the families know about this, but it, you could. It... Yeah. Well, I'm wondering whether anyone from the foundation is on who would like to actually, it's their, they got the award, not me. Yeah, I've had a hard time um, yes. inviting okay. people, but let me try. I see Beth is on. Let me. Oh, cool. Beth, do you want to try? It didn't work before, but Beth should be able, able to talk now, according to my. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for this awesome talk. As I told you guys, my daughter is about to graduate from high school, so I have about two minutes <laughs> before I have to go do that. But um, yes, Liz Berger and I, who co-founded the foundation, along with a group of other amazing parents, wrote our dissertation into DDX3X, which was a big deal. For um, to get this CZI grant. So we're part of the Rare is One group and Dorothy is our chief clinician and Elliot Scher is um, our chief researcher. And we applied for the grant, which they were originally going to give to 10 families and they are 10 foundations for rare disease groups. And they ended up funding 30 of us. And it has really been an incredible opportunity for us to get on the roadmap to um, finding a plan towards a treatment for DDX3X syndrome and to have access to amazing science advisors and also to these other rare disease groups who we've learned just as much from as with everyone. So that's been really an amazing opportunity. And we have the opportunity to apply for an additional grant with them as well that's continuing. So we're working on that too. Uh, and, and congratulations on the graduation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute and go. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Beth. And I, I do think to the to the point of, of all these collaborations and certainly the CZI initiative, you know, COVID has really uh, knocked us all back. It's obviously knocked the families back who've had to deal with, uh, you know, somebody people with disabilities, uh, you know, and a fairly significant change in lifestyle but also some of the plans about getting together and creating research networks have really been put on hold because we have not been able to get together. <laughs> so we're hoping that some of these collaborative uh, studies will really, really start ramping up again now that uh, we're just kind of, you know, at least, at least in some countries, um, coming to the tail of the worst of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and then uh, maybe we're coming back to speech and language. One of the questions we had is about can what we do, for example, be done remotely? Um, and the short answer, Tess, you can take. Short that. answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, 
The majority of the language and communication evaluations can be done remotely. Some of them, including the direct evaluations, um, we've adapted to be remote. Um, for some individuals, it's hard for them to stare at Zoom for so many hours and do all these evaluations. So some people find it easier in person, um, but we can definitely at least attempt all of them uh, remotely. And the reason I underscore the word we, what we do is because obviously there are many things that you can do with speech and language that would require a fairly extensive in-person um, inter uh, interactions. And I will come, I will note that one of the participants is a, a speech and language pathologist with interest in this area. And I'm encouraging anybody who's interested, who is an, you know, wants to, we are building this network of sites and it would be great to get input from SLP individuals about what, what each site can do either remotely or in person uh, for the purposes of addressing this important question. And I, I'm being very careful not to, um, to help mention people's names or specifics about them. We have been told uh, in the past that that can be a violation of um, per personal health information or HIPAA. And if we violate HIPAA, we cannot post this video anymore because we're not allowed to let somebody personal information out and then post it online for everybody to find out. So I apologize for some of the stilted ways I'm answering questions or half answering them or not giving not sharing your names or the great or the great questions that you've asked um, or giving too many personal details. Um, but um, we think that the benefit, you can always reach out to us and we can answer questions directly. Um, but in public, we, we are bound by um, human subjects rules and protections. Um, and we're, you know, if, if you said hi and gave us your name, we wouldn't be able to you know, repeat it to anybody <laughs> without a written consent. Um, so I think I think the speech and language, as, as we've heard, is a, is an area that the Family Foundation has been very focused on. And I think we can do some assessments remotely, but uh, interventions are in person. And some of the most detailed things are going to be even most detailed assessments will be in person. And I think that's an opportunity to do something acro across multiple sites, where even if one site sees can just see five individuals, but you have ten sites, you suddenly have fifty. Right. So that's why we think that the network is such a critical thing. Um, all right. So I think, uh, by the way, uh, we've got some people volunteering to come come to the come to the center or send blood by mail. Um, Becky, that's to you. Do you want to get some? Uh, you want to get some blood? Uh, um, unfortunately, it has to be high, preserved in a very, very specific way. <laughs> Not trivial. And uh, and people are also asking about you know the age range, right? We say we'd like to see people early, and of course, adults uh, and everything in between. So, what is early? What is early? What would be the youngest age um, we could possibly see? That's a great question. It's probably also dependent on the particular measurements and whether they've been made um, appropriate and studied in the young in, in younger children. I think the youngest person we had. Can I say that? I can say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It was in the paper, right? The range, the age range, the youngest age person uh, was four. I think three when they came. Three when they came. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but to your point, you know, in other, in other instances, and it hasn't happened with DDX3X yet, we've got people who've reached out to us when they had a diagnosis at six months for another rare genetic disorder, and we brought them in, even though, of course, many of the things, the tests we do, you can't do it at six month old, but the, the decision was, you know, why not see the six month old at six months? And then they'll come back when they're, you know, if the family is interested and, and willing to, they'll come back in a year or two years or three years and we could do more and more. And so um, I do think that, you know, there's a lot to be said for even doing something in the youngest individuals. Of course, it won't be the full battery that's done. Some of the things, you know, you can't even do um, yeah, some of the things we do, you, you couldn't, you can't do in a two-year-old even or a three-year-old, right? or you can't reliably do. So. Um, and on the on the on the other side, um, because of all the interest in changes over time, and um, you know even regression, uh, adults with the syndrome, you know, are um, are very important to be brought in. And uh, you know one of the things 
uh, in the research space, we get dinged a lot about, well, if the, if the range is too broad, you know, is, is it just too messy? Wouldn't it be great to only study, you know, four to seven year olds, uh, but we don't take that view because it's a rare disorder. And even if we can look at, see individuals at different ages in a cross-sectional way, that's already a first start to tell us, for example, you know, practice parameters. What if for some syndrome, and it's, I don't think it's true for DDX3X syndrome, there are things that happen when you're 25 that the family has to watch out for, right? Um, you won't know that unless you saw some 25 year olds, right? Uh, or you follow people from two until they're 25, and that's a long study to do. <laughs> All right, we're getting towards the end. Um, and, oh, yes, I see that uh, folks are starting to log out, uh, and I appreciate, you know, we, we in the academic space have and probably also in many industries now spend all day on Zoom, hours a day, and uh, just about kills us. But uh, we appreciate that some of you, um, not only are you, are you on Zoom for multiple hours in a row in a very highly technical area, but also, uh, as I said, many people from Europe and from the uh, also the West Coast where um, it wasn't too terrible, but everyone wants to get back to their things. So, Thank you all for your presentations. I really think they were all great. Um, thank you for all the attendees and for all the great questions from the attendees. I think it really kind of helped us kind of work through some of the ideas. Uh, and I hope that people are comfortable reaching out to us about anything that we've come up with, including, um, you know, if you have an expertise that you'd like to contribute to um, a multi-site you know, planning study, or you want to join, um, in some of our studies, you want to sign up and get on the wait list. If you want to give advice and tell us all the things we could do better or, or support us in the other, any other way, you have um, the contact information and even those first emails from us. Um, you can email any of us that who's, who, whose email address you have and we will make sure it gets to the right person. So thank you again and um, have a great uh, afternoon, evening, nighttime. Um, and a lot of compliments from the audience. Uh, th uh, thanks to the speakers and that, you know, great talks, great work. Thank you for what you're doing. And, um, and people are also asking, um, well, there are more questions coming and I think we probably have to wrap up, but uh, people who have participated in the study, please stay in touch because we do want to move towards a longitudinal study. Right? We do want to, it's, you know, it, it costs money and, and it costs time and effort and we have to figure out how to um, put resources behind it. But we do think, I think, I think no, but nobody doubts that longitudinal studies are, are, the, are our next critical step. And um, I'll end with that. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, have a good Thanks, time. everybody.